Hey folks, Mark Zeno here for The Hazard Ground. Before we start with this week's episode, just a quick note because events in the world have prompted us to make a special announcement and we want to take a moment to remember Navy SEAL and Team 8 Commander Brian Bourgeois who died December 7th after sustaining injuries in a training event. Along with Brian, we want to remember his family, his wife and his children and also his Naval Special Warfare family. Brian was as well as respected an individual as there is in the SEAL community. And from the SEALs that fought alongside him in combat to the soft support staff and leaders who directly supported their operations. Most importantly, though, Brian was a father of five children who will miss him dearly. If you'd like to support Brian's wife and his children, you can do so with a monetary donation at the All In All The Time Foundation website. Just go to shop.aiatt.org. Again, shop.aiatt.org. Click on the Donate Now button. And that will link you right to Brian's Memorial Fund. We'll also post a link to Brian's donation page at the All In All The Time Foundation on our social media. We certainly appreciate you spending a moment with us. Please keep Brian Bourgeois and his family in your thoughts and prayers. Thank you and enjoy this week's episode. You're listening to Kill Cliff's Hazard Ground Podcast with service members from across the military sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. Welcome into the Hazard Ground Podcast. As always, we appreciate you joining us each and every week. Before we get started with this week's episode, which is a guest who is connected to actually several other Hazard Ground guests, and he's still on active duty. We'll get to him in just a moment, but just a few reminders. First, make sure you download that Kill Cliff TV app, guys, uh, and you can get all of our episodes there as well as on our YouTube channel. But the Kill Cliff TV app is one of the other ways you can get the Hazard Ground podcast. Check out killcliff.com for the best clean energy drinks, including their Killer Cliff Sickle. If you're into CBD and can use CBD, this Killer Cliff Sickle is top of the line. I use Kill Cliff for a lot of my pre-workout and post-workout drinks. A fantastic company. A lot of their proceeds go to benefit the Navy SEAL Foundation, started by a Navy SEAL, killcliff.com, for all of your clean energy drinks. Don't forget about our promotion with Amazon which you can help donate to veterans all across America just by going to hazardground.com first. And you click on the Amazon button at the bottom of the homepage or under the Sponsors tab. It'll redirect you right to Amazon. You do all your normal Amazon shopping, and then we get a percentage of what you spend, and then we donate a percentage of that back to some of the great charities and organizations you've heard featured here on the Hazard Ground. Works on your smartphone, too. From It'll redirect you from your smartphone browser right to the app, so all your credit card information is saved and everything. Very easy and convenient and a great way to help out veterans just by shopping on Amazon, but you got to go to hazardground.com first. Don't forget about our social media sites, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at hazardground, at hazardground podcast. You can find us there. Keep up with the show. Send us guest suggestions if you like as well. And then finally, don't forget about leaving us reviews on Apple Podcasts. Grow the Hazard Ground community. There are so many of you who reach out to us, but we need to get those reviews up on Apple so this way we can grow the podcast even bigger and better. So we certainly appreciate all of your support on that front. All right, on to this week's guest, who currently has served over 22 years and is currently on active duty in the United States Air Force with the rank of Colonel. He's a senior pilot with over 1,500 flying hours in the A-10 Warthog, and the AT-38 is an instructor pilot. Uh, He currently works in the Office of the Secretary of Defense, and he's also been awarded the Bronze Star and the Air Force Commendation Medal of Valor. He is John Koch Bloker joining us on the Hazard Ground Podcast. Koch, welcome in, and thank you for joining us. Thanks, Mark. I'm glad to be here. Glad to be here. Uh, Just amazing. And and I told everybody earlier that you were connected to some other guests. If you remember when we interviewed Billy Bob Thornton and Donk Strasberger, uh, you worked with those guys during the invasion as well. Kim Campbell, who was a pilot who was shot down um, during the invasion of Iraq. She is somebody you also are connected to through your service. So I love this sort of, you know, uh, interconnectivity, the serendipity of all this, of all of our hazard ground guests coming together uh, to tell uh, a similar story. So uh, just just an amazing, amazing tenure for you. And uh, working up in Washington now, before I get to you, I'm just curious, what's it like working in Washington every day? God, it looks miserable. Um, so I do say that this is my one and only Pentagon tour. Um, <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, a little bit political, a little bit divided, sure. yeah. a little bit... Uh, a little bit of angry up here. Um, 
I am. Uh, I just got my next assignment. And I'm very excited. I'm moving out to the other Washington in Washington State, ah. going to Joint Base Lewis McCord. So I am looking forward to putting some miles between me and Washington D.C. Having said that, I did. I so I grew up in the suburbs of Washington D.C. So this is a little bit normal for me. Gotcha. Um, I, I, you know, coming back, I saw some of the changes. Uh, you know, getting being in the building, uh, you get to see them up close, particularly mm-hmm. in the position that I'm in. Um, but it's been it's been a wild ride. I've been here since. 2019. So I've got to see, have had the opportunity to see the last couple of years of uh, kind of crazy politics um, and back and forth from a, uh, I would say a, a, <laughs> a courtside seat. Um, and it's been interesting, fascinating is what I like to say, uh, a little disheartening, um, <laughs> but, uh, but a yeah. uh, lot, lot of adjectives yeah. there. I, I'll, I'll say mm. it this way from, from the mud slinging of Washington DC to the rain and mud of the Pacific Northwest onward and upward you go. Hell yeah, that is onward and upward. <laughs> okay, uh, back at the beginning, uh, when and how did you get in the Air Force? Uh, so I went to the Air Force Academy, mm-hmm. uh, graduated high school in 1995, headed off to the Air Force Academy. I really, um, so it's a funny story how I, I got to kind of know about it. My grandpa was in the Army Air Corps for a very short time. He got kicked out of the Army Air Corps for flying his airplane upside down over the tower. Um, so he ended up in World War II as a submarine guy because they kicked him out of the Army Air Corps, and, but they, he still had to serve. So he ended up in subs in the Navy. And, uh, and so he took my brother on a college visit to the Naval Academy. And I just tagged along because he was my older brother and I thought it was interesting. Uh, and I went and I saw it and I was like, wow, this is cool, but this boat thing, not interested. So I uh, started to look into the Air Force Academy, went out on their summer program, saw the mountains, realized what that meant for an awesome skiing life and said, I'm sold. So that's, uh, I didn't really go into the Air Force to be in the Air Force. I went to the Air Force Academy to go to the Air Force Academy. Um, It just seemed like awesome opportunities, a ton of fun and a great location. And I said, let's do this. Yeah, you know, so many times when you make those decisions in the military based off of something like that, uh, it ends up backfiring wildly in your face. Uh, (laughs) So credit to you for, for, for going to the Air Force for the skiing in the mountains of Colorado and still ending up, you know, sane and not, uh, not somewhere else. So it's funny you should say that because it, in some ways it did backfire on me. Cause I like, I was not a good kid at, like I was not, uh, uh, I, I got in a lot of trouble during my time at the Academy. Um, I, I was good, like basic training and the initial freshman year, I kind of figured that out and just kind of could gut through it. Um, but then as it kind of wore on, I just wanted to be a college student and you can't be a college student at the Air Force Academy. Uh, so, but I will say I'm, you know, the Air Force Academy is not always a great place to be, but it's a great place to be from. Um, and um, the experiences that I had there and even the trouble that I got in, I don't regret because it it really gave me an appreciation for my career. I mean, I almost threw it all away just through being a stupid college kid. Um, and so it really gave me an appreciation that I really did want to be in the Air Force. And this was something that I really wanted. So my time at the Air Force Academy was really formative in my life to give me a very strong sense of purpose and desire. And uh, when I entered the Air Force and graduated from the Academy, I was all in. I was all about it. And I kind of went to the Air Force Academy naively, but I entered the Air Force uh, with eyes wide open and really excited. So you and I are the same age. When you commissioned in 99, we obviously didn't have 9-11 yet. So it was a different world and a different environment. Mm -hmm. Where are you headed and sort of what, uh, what are you thinking at that point in time? Uh, so, I mean, to put it in perspective in 99, my graduation speech at the Academy was Bill Clinton giving uh, justification for, uh, the war in Kosovo. Um, so yeah, we were not thinking about global war on terror, but there was certainly, you know, recent events where the A-10 was involved. Um, and we were in, you know, we, we were doing some combat. It wasn't like the, the military was in a cold war mentality. We kind of come uh, come out of that. And so there was, a, I, I went into it with a sense of the, you know, we're, this is meaningful and we're going to be doing something here. And it, and um, it's the same thing I say to, you know, young lieutenants today is, you know, when I entered the military, I didn't know what Afghanistan was or Iraq was never, never even thought about those places. Um, and that's where the majority of my career is spent focused. Whereas when they're in, if you're in the military today, it's probably another place that you've never thought of or heard of. Um, and that's where we're going to spend the next 20 years because we're going to be needed. We're, we're, we're going to play a major role in the world. Um, so, so I entered just kind of trusting that, Hey, we're going to have a role to play and, and it's going to be awesome. And I just want to do this fighter pilot thing because 
that sounds great. So I graduated and went off to pilot training. Um, I was a little bit strange. Uh, so I did a, I volunteered to do the exchange with the Navy. Um, it was mainly for, um, selfish reasons. Cause my wife was, uh, so I graduated in 99, about six months later, I married another Academy grad. Um, she was a maintenance officer. She was stationed at Moody air force base. Okay. Um, and so I went to Pensacola for pilot training just to be close to her because Valdosta air force base where she was or Valdosta Moody air force base was about four hours down the road. So it was as close as I could get. Um, so got married and I headed off to pilot training, um, with the Navy, which was a really interesting experience. The, uh, just a different attitude towards, um, uh, rules <laughs> towards, <laughs> uh, towards aviation. Um, so, uh, but it was really good. But the weird part was, is that a lot of people coming out of that exchange were not being fighter pilots. They were, they were behind their air force peers just because it was different, not because it was, um, it just didn't prepare you as well for Air Force pilot training. And what happened was, is halfway through pilot training, you kind of had to shift. And and yeah, I went to Vance Air Force Base after that, jumped into the T-38, much faster aircraft, now flying under Air Force uh, rules and kind of ways of doing business. And it was a rough transition. Um, so the fact that I was able to finish up pilot training and get my first choice and go fly the A-10, I, you know, it's the grace of God that, 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 that happened because I would, did not set myself up for success, um, to make, make that path. Uh, it was a, it was a challenging path, but one that, um, I mean, I certainly don't regret it. Certainly put me exactly where I wanted to be. So where are you on nine 11? So on nine 11, I'm actually strangely at Moody air force base. My wife had deployed to Kuwait in operation Southern watch. Uh, and she got home on September 6th, oh, wow. 2001, and so I was out at Moody. I'd worked it out so that when she got home, I would be as a student in uh, the introduction, introduction to Fighter Fundamentals course, which was being uh, carried out at Moody. Um, so I had, on that morning, I had left, um, uh, left our little apartment and was driving to base. And I remember as I drove on to Moody Air Force Base, I watched as an airman walked out from the gate and right as he had just waved me through and I watched him flick the sign from FP con alpha to Delta. Oh and boy. I was like, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? Um, I, like I thought it was an exercise, right? Sure. Like that's, yeah. we, we do this, right? Like they, I mean, things hadn't really changed. I was just going through the gate. Um, and so I drive through the gate and I drive over to uh, the squadron and I run into my, um, flight commander who's standing in the parking lot trying to make a phone call on a cell phone very angrily. Right. Um, and uh, I remember driving up and getting out of the car and going, hey, Stan, what's up? Um, and he's just like, just go inside, watch the TV. The world just changed. Um, and I, so I walk inside and I, I literally walk inside um, and I don't know if it was a replay or whether it was actually the original uh, time it happened. I just don't remember. But there was just this itty bitty TV right across from the ops desk when you walked into the squadron. And I remember looking up at it and right as my first glimpse was an airplane hitting the, the, the tower. Wow. And I, I mean, it was just, it was absolutely shocking. I was supposed to be flying that day. Um, I was going in to fly a sortie, one of my very last IFF sorties before I head off to go fly the T-38. That was my plan for that day. But that did not happen, obviously, as, as you know, basically all sorties were grounded that day, ex except for combat and pseudo combat sorties where we launched people without weapons on board, but trying to figure out how to deal with this. But um, so I went, I sat down in the, um, in the briefing room with a big screen up and we just watched TV. And it was, it was really surreal because you're sitting there in an introduction of fighter fundamentals course, which is a training course. Um, you don't actually have any weapons on that jet. It's the first time you get to use a jet as a weapon. Um, the first time you ever take a T-38 and you start doing dogfighting and basic bomb dropping, but it's not a combat aircraft. It's a training aircraft. And all the instructor pilots that are there, every single one of them, they're all fighter pilots. They're all just ready to go, but they're sitting in a position where they're not in their jet to be able to go. So you're, there's, there was just an energy in that room of uh, the world has changed, the, and I'm going to be involved in this. There, right. it, it was just a, a, an acceptance and a very rapid transition, almost 
instantaneous of the, I know this is going to affect my future in ways that I can't possibly imagine, but I'm all in and everybody was all in. Um, so it's just, it was really powerful. And, and actually it, it turned out that literally my next sortie was in the A-10 after 9-11. I, I went out, I, by then I'd graduated. Oh, wow. I was just doing a, a last currency sortie that they waived and they basically just said, go out and start flying the A-10. So after 9-11, uh, my next experience in an airplane was in a combat aircraft and I was ready to go. Where? In Afghanistan or Iraq? No, no, Tucson. So I, okay. I it was my very first sortie in an A-10. I didn't know how gotcha. to okay. employ the thing. So it wasn't, it wasn't time to go fight yet. It was time to go learn how to fight. Got you. Got you. Okay. Um, so how long does that process take and when do you, uh, actually get to your first deployment? Uh, so, um, uh, longer than you'd hope. Yeah, sure. Um, so I got to Tucson, I want to say it was October ish, uh, 2001. Um, and then, uh, FTU flying fighter training unit, the, basically the training course is called a B course is what we call it. Um, to become qualified to fly the A-10 and to employ the A-10 in combat is about a six-month-long course. So I spent six months in Tucson, uh, davis Monthan Air Force Base, uh, learning how to basically be a wingman. Um, all, all I was qualified to do was employ the aircraft air-to-ground, um, defend myself air-to-air, uh, do close air support, do combat search and rescue, the basic missions as a wingman. That's all I was qualified to do. Um, and so I finished that up. Um, and got out to my squadron at the end of the spring. I want to say it was May timeframe, uh, 2002 now. Um, and I arrived. And when I arrived to my first squadron, I effectively showed up. And my first experience in the squadron was doing a bag drag for my squadron to leave. Um, they were going to Afghanistan and I was missing it. Um, so I, had, I was the brand new guy, wasn't fully qualified, you go through what's called a uh, MQT, mission qualification training, uh, right when you arrive to a new squadron to, for them to kind of put you through those last upgrades and to, to, to certify you as combat mission ready. I had not gone through that yet. So I wasn't ready to go to combat, but just barely not ready. Um, so I showed up in time to do a bag drag, throw all of my squadron mates on C-17s and an A-10s and wave them, wave goodbye as they headed to Afghanistan and I stayed, stayed behind. And I would, you know, I, you would think that maybe I felt a sense of loss or this isn't fair, but I really didn't like they were, I just knew that, okay, well, it's not my turn. My turn will come. Um, so it wasn't like this sense of like, Oh, I just missed out on something. Um, the biggest letdown was the fact that with my squadron gone, you didn't fly much. Like it just, it kind of sucked. Like you were back home with a very small contingent of people. You were trying to get your upgrade done. You're trying to get, you know, more and more experience, but you just didn't get as many opportunities as you wanted to, you know, very hungry young wingmen. Um, so I honestly, I spent, it forced me to spend a lot of time in the vault learning about, you know, enemy tactics, studying, doing, you know, ground prep, ground emergencies. Um, it kind of, it, it gave me the time to, to prepare to be the best wingman I possibly could be, um, but not as much time as I wanted in the jet. So I ended up uh, sending my squadron off uh, to go. Uh, getting combat mission ready. And then we also, on the side, um, while they were gone, uh, we had this BALO program. It was kind of this afterthought where it was the, oh, every A-10 pilot has to do this, so you have to do this. And what it was, was they would take you out for a, a you know couple, three days to the field and teach you basic ground forward air controller capabilities. And they would actually qualify you as a BALO. It's called a battalion air liaison officer. So it's the, you do the liaison part with the army in the talk with your, at the, at the battalion level. So it's you as the young Lieutenant, you know, working with the uh, battalion commander, Lieutenant Colonel from the army. Um, and, and they're teaching you how to do that side, but then also you're a fully qualified JTAC. So joint terminal attack controller, you're qualified to be on the radio, on the ground, say cleared hot, um, and, and do everything that is required to call in close air support in, uh, in close proximity with friendly forces. So they, they spun you up on that, but I would, you'd like to think that it was a significant investment of time and energy. But like I said, it was an afterthought. We never, up until that point, we basically never did it. And so it was, it was a pencil whip. It was a, how fast can I do this? What's the minimal effort I can put in to make sure this is done because I want to go back to the vault. I want to go back to flying. I want to go back to doing my real job. Um, and so I spent as little time as possible 
doing that and then press back to flying. My squadron gets back home. And very quickly after they got home, we kind of saw that writing on the wall about um, Iraq. Um, You saw, um, so this was, you know, they got back, I mean, late 2002. um, I want to say sometime in the September timeframe. And, you know, you get back in September, I mean, March 2003 was the invasion. They, they're immediately turning as fast as possible to get ready to deploy. Um, and part of it, and Donk might have told you a little bit about this in his, but they wanted to go before the other squadron. Um, so our squadron, I was in the 75th fighter squadron. And um, it, I don't know whether, I don't know the historics behind it, but the 74th almost always went first and the 75th went second. Um, I don't know. Maybe it was just numerical order. Who, who knows? But, um, so the, but the 75th was like, no, it's our turn. We're going first. And so we were doing everything we could to spin up and get ready to go. Um, and I was with it. I was all on board. I was a fully qualified wingman. I'm like, now this is going to be my turn. This is going to be awesome. Really excited. Um, and December 2002, I will remember this day vividly in my memory. Um, right before I'm about to go uh, off on Christmas leave for a few days, my flight commander, Billy Bob Thornton, calls me into his office and he says, Hey, uh, Hey Coke. Um, so, um, we're, it looks like we're, we're going to Iraq, uh, and you're not going with us. Um, and I, I mean, just a punch in the gut. Um, I mean, he just continued to go on, Hey, I know, you know, about the Balo program and I know that, you know, that it doesn't generally get called on. But in this case, the army is basically saying, I want, I want everybody that's supposed to be on my MTO. I want everybody that's supposed to be going with me to war. Um, and it just so happens that um, 269 Armor, we've uh, decided to align your name against it. And you are going to be the first person out the door. So, there, I mean, no warning. None of my peers had been grabbed to do anything else. None of my, like, didn't see it coming was fully preparing to go fly, fight, and win, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and just an absolute gut punch. And I mean, you go through the whole grief cycle, right? Like it's denial and anger and frustration. And, you know, I, I look back at the, I missed the last one by seconds. What's going on? I mean, just a sense of why me? Um, uh, and I mean, yeah, I was a little pissed off. And this for a is just while because there. you can't actually fly, right? Like you're still deploying, yeah. but you're just not yeah. going to do it in an aircraft. Correct. Oh, okay. yeah. You're exactly right. In fact, the funny thing is, is I mean, I don't. He probably said this, but by this point, I wasn't really listening to him. Is that in reality we were going to meet in Baghdad? Right. I mean, I was I was going to Iraq as well. I just wasn't going with them. Right. Um. And so, but that, but for me, that was that's not what I trained for, right? Sure. Like that's not what I wanted. That's not what I mean. They'd invested. Literally, you know, they, we, we joke about it, but they invested millions yeah. of dollars to train me up. And now you're throwing me with an army unit to go be on the front lines or, and I, at that point, I actually thought to go be in a talk somewhere for somebody else to be on the front lines. Um, why me? You know, like, I, right. I, 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 why would you do this? So there was, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I went home over Christmas kind of in denial, um, and just, you know, spend a little time soul searching and, and, you know, get into that time to accept that, Hey, this is what, this is what the plan is. Mm-hmm. This is what God's plan is. I don't know what the heck, but that's where I'm headed. Well. Um, and I came back and I came back from, uh, from Christmas break. I didn't, I didn't take a long Christmas and I came back and I'm like, all right, if I'm going to go, I'm going right now. I'm not waiting. I want to get there as soon as possible. Um, I want to go down and I want to find the unit, the air force unit that I'm going to be embedded with. And if I can get to them before they even leave to go overseas, then so be it. And so in days, like I came off of leave and in, I mean, 48 hours or so, I was fully ready to go. They kitted me up with, I mean, so the Air Force, right? This Balo program had tons of money. And so we had all the newest body armor. We had, I literally, they handed me a brand new M4. I had to clean out the packing grease, <laughs> um, laser sight on top. Like, I mean, every, I was kitted out like you, o- Oakley goggles, like brand new helmet. Like I, 
you don't realize it now because we see so many pictures of JTACs with the kitted out helmet and the kitted out everything. And most people have that now. Right. That was unseen back in the day. Like to have a, the concept of a Peltor headset or those types of things, those, that was a soft thing. You, you did, the regular guys didn't get that. And certainly the army didn't get that. So I got all kinds of kitted out and sent off to Fort Benning. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm the squeaky clean Lieutenant, right? Like I am young and I, and I look at, right. Like I look back at pictures of myself. I look like I'm 12 years old. Um, and so, um, so I go down to Benning. Um, I meet up with the unit that I'm going to deploy with. It's the 17th ASOS. Uh, meet up with a, a guy, uh, the, basically the, the s- sergeants that I'm going to be deploying with. Because the, the setup, the kind of the unit that goes at the battalion level is a lieutenant or a captain to be in the talk, to be the, the leader of that. And then usually three or four JTAC slash romance. Back then we had you know the JTAC and then the, the radio operator guy um, airman, usually a really young guy. And so in my case, it was a guy named Chris Weeks, Zach Nell, and my two other JTACs and Erica Kendo was our, our young Romad, uh, airman at the time. And so our little group, that's the first time I met them down at, at, at Benning. We actually got to go out at Benning and control a couple of times, did a night control and really started, I, I started the process. And the way I describe this is basically training, like my life depended on it, right? Like I, I realized, you know, kind of over that Christmas break, I realized I am not prepared for this. There are all, everybody that I'm about to join, every airman, this is what they trained to do. And this is what they prepared their whole life to do. Every army soldier I'm going to meet, this is their Super Bowl. This is what they've been training to do. And I've been trained to do something else. And I'm not ready for this. Um, and it scared the crap out of me. Um, it, and it, re- it really was a a wake up call of the, I am in over my head and it just got worse, far, far worse before it got better. So just to kind of continue the story and, and move this along, I go down to Benning, I jump on a rotator, we fly over to Kuwait. Um, I jump in a Humvee, get picked up by, um, I think it was probably a staff sergeant, uh, Josh Corbett. And he picks me up, throws me, throws my bags in the back of a Humvee and we drive off into the middle of nowhere. Um, I mean, so Kuwait International, you know, it's Kuwait, Kuwait's a big city. It's it's lots of lights, lot, very uh, relatively modern at the time, and we drive off literally into the blackness of nothingness. Um, and and I, oh man, they're just that pit of the stomach. Like, what have I gotten myself into? What what is happening? And so we drive out. And we arrive in the, you know, it's a, it's the evening time frame, And uh, Josh basically says to me, I just leave your bags in the car. Um, I guarantee you there's a, a cub going on, commander's update brief in the talk. We're going in right now. Um, and so he drags me in there and there I am in my, you know, probably still slightly crisp, clean desert camo that I've probably worn twice on my, you know, brand new boots, brand new kit you know, 12 year old looking Lieutenant. And I walk into this talk with, I mean, tent filled with army to the nth degree. Mm-hmm. Battalion commander is, uh, J.R. Sanderson, Lieutenant Colonel. Um, he's a Georgia boy with it spoke with just an absolutely drawl accent. Um, he kind of felt like he had a dip in at all times, whether he actually had one in or not. Um, and three, you know, rugged looking captains sitting at the table as his company commanders and his entire staff. And they're all, I walk in there and they're all looking at me and uh, basically interrupt this briefing um, as we kind of walk in and try to kind of sleep, slip in the back. And I get my first observation of what's going on. And very rapidly, the battalion commanders looking over at Sergeant Corbett and saying, all right, Air Force, um, who you got? And so Corbett walks up and says, sir, I'd like to, you know, introduce you to your uh, air liaison officer who's going to be with you for the next uh, however long time. Uh, This is Lieutenant Bloker. And uh, and I I think he he, might have even, I think he mispronounced my name, didn't even really know me. Um, And so (laughs) Colonel Sanderson looks at me. I swear he's probably spit in his spittoon by his foot. And he goes... Hmm. Air Force, you're purdy. I'm going to call you purdy. (laughs) 
And let me tell you, like, it was the most hostile environment I've ever walked into. Why? Like, I mean, I, I was not wanted. I was not like, they had their sergeant who they had already built a relationship with. They had their sergeant that they knew had done this before and that they trusted. And it at least had been there for a few weeks already and kind of suffered through. He'd actually deployed with them. So he'd gone with them through the deployment process. So he was, he was on the inside and I was very much on the outside. And come to find out later that, that, um, the, the, the tension that I felt, the hostility that I felt from the battalion commander um, really was, it was founded on something. He was in Gulf War I. And he was in a fratricide incident uh, where a, and it was actually an army Apache, but where something in the air had blown up one of his closest friends. Wow. Um, and so he had scar tissue that everything that I represented um, was the opposite side of. Everything that I was, was scary, um, something he couldn't control. Yeah, I mean, he said this to me, he said, look, we're driving into Iraq and there is nothing that the Iraqis have that can kill one of my Abrams tanks. There is nothing, but you can. I, he, he was scared of me. He was scared of what he knew a mistake from me could cause. And like I said, right. I, 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 don't, I don't blame him, right? I'm, I know that I look like a 12-year-old lieutenant and that I look like I don't know what I'm doing. When I look back now, at that time, I was like, well, screw you, dude. Um, <laughs> you can call me Coke. And I'll, you know, I'll show up to your cub whenever I want to. Yeah, that didn't happen. So, um, so <laughs> sounded great in your head, right? In theory, like it, it just did. works out up here. It, yeah, it, I didn't. Thank goodness those words did not come out of the mouth. There was a filter somewhere in there that stopped them. Um, so, so I did not get a welcome reception um, with the army, and that lasted a while. Um, and it even it even trickled down a little bit. Like I didn't. I certainly didn't feel accepted by. Um, by even the captains, I was a lieutenant, um, uh, and most of my, you know, quote unquote peers that were doing the jobs that I was doing um, were were all captains. So they, I just didn't, I didn't feel like I fit in, and I didn't fit in. I mean, I was the Air Force guy, and so I had to, I had to earn my way in, and that took a long time. And so um, one of the ways that I started to earn my way in was just absolutely throw myself at my work, at my training, at everything. I was there for every brief. I was there for every, every extra opportunity to integrate every extra thing. Like I, I mean, everything you could possibly think of, they set up a shoot course. I was going and shooting. Um, they set up a, you know, an extra rock drill. I was there. They, anything, anything they were doing, I was always there. Cause I knew I I've got to figure this out. My life might depend on this and I don't know what I'm doing. Um, and so the air force even set up a bunch of stuff. We got to go control on the, the range there in Kuwait. Um, and I just threw myself into every job I could possibly think of. I sat down with my Romad. Uh, I spent more hours with Eric Akendo and a pallet. Cause, uh, I don't know if you're familiar, but the, at that point, the equipment that the JTAC was using, it wasn't that cool digital radio. You had, you had one cool digital radio. And the only thing that that talked to was the ASOC back you could use satcom back to the rear but you couldn't talk to yeah. airplanes with it and so the the radios you were going to talk to the army with you're going to have an, an fm radio to talk to the army a uhf and a vhf to talk to the air force uh, depending upon which type of aircraft etc um and then you were going to have a, an fm radio fm radio to talk to the, to the army uhf vhf and uh and so you and all of these are different radios so you had this huge pallet with this huge battery and everything always broke um, it looked like an old electrical, like cords running from one radio to the next with uh, power. And then you had to deal with encryption to make sure you could encrypt things. So that's another piece of equipment. And so it was painfully intricate. I was not trained on it. So I just sat down with Eric and I was like, dude, teach me everything. I need to be able to build this thing from scratch. And so I became a romat. I became a radio operator. And it's a good thing too, because my battalion commander, as we, as we started to plan how we were going to tactically execute his solution for me of how concerned he was about integrating the Air Force in a way that was going to um, avoid fratricide. And I knew that that was, that was my primary goal was to, to, in, to con gain his trust and prove to him that there was never, never going to be a fratricide incident. Sure. Um, his fix for that, his solution was to put me 
in a 113, which is an armored personnel carrier, yep. mm-hmm. about 100 meters off his right flank, flying wedge off of his, his tank. So he was going to drive around in his Abrams, and I was going to be in this 113 that was right behind him. And, and what he did is he took the FSO, a guy named Andy McLean, fire support officer. He was the head artillery shooter. I was the head you know, uh, airplane guy. And he was going to put us in the same vehicle standing next to each other so that we could deconflict one another and all of his indirect fires would be physically close to him as well as properly integrated with one another. That's smart. Um, it is. It really, and honestly, it was the best solution you could possibly make. The difficult part was, um, I got to tell you, Josh Corbett wanted to be the guy standing there, my staff sergeant, because he knew that that he was probably more qualified to do it than I was because mm-hmm. he'd been training for that. Um, and it, it, through circumstance, um, his wife was pregnant um, and he ended up, um, I think in the late January, early February timeframe, he actually went back home uh, for the birth of his kid and he did not make it back before we rolled North. Um, so, so it ended up not actually being an argument. Um, it ended up, I was the only option um, so I ended up and, and that was, it was great. And we proved in tactical execution that it was the best possible solution for me. Uh, Captain Annie McLean was the, the fire support officer and me in that, in that vehicle. And so, so that was kind of our setup. That was our solution. And that is how I prepared for war. That right. was, <laughs> that was the, well, the buildup. So let's, let's fast forward a little bit. Um, because the invasion of Iraq happens on March 20th, 03. Um, Objective Monty, which were you a part of in April 6th of 2003, it's less than three weeks later. Um, yeah. Give me sort of the the, the quick run up to April 6th, but the, the initial part of the invasion obviously goes fairly well, all things considered with minimal casualties, but uh, April 6th turned out to be a different day. Yeah. So um, just to give kind of the big picture overview of kind of what my battalion did um, is... 269 Armor, part of 3rd Infantry Division. Mm-hmm. Um, the way they, they split the battlefield was basically the Marines took the east and they went up roughly along uh, the Tigris River. Yep. The Army took the west. They went up roughly along the Euphrates River. And the Army basically was doing the leapfrog where one battalion would kind of be the lead battalion and fight a fight. And then they would finish and either hold that ground or allow for a forward passage of lines. And then the next battalion would pass through and then fight the next fight. And so we were doing this leapfrog up the west side. So um, the you mentioned it, March 20th for me was incredibly anticlimactic. So we we spend our time in the desert getting ready. We push up close to the border. We spend some time there. I get to, uh, you know, as we know this is going to happen, I'm getting closer and closer with Andy McLean. Uh, we realized that we're just, you know, brothers that we're, that, that's my band of brotherhood. Um, and, and so he is just investing in me to teach me and get me ready to go. We March 20th happens. They say it's time to roll North and we roll across the berm and my initial, you know, war experience, I'm in enemy territory and we spend 72 hours straight driving. That's it. Like <laughs> the longest road March in the history of anything I've ever done. And it was miserable. Um, I mean, just sitting in the back of a one, one, three, just bouncing around wondering, you know, when is this ever going to end? Um, and are just we there yet? pushing up. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Seriously. <laughs> Seriously. I, I will say this. It gave me a great appreciation and understanding why every single driver of every single tracked vehicle dips in the army. It's the only way they stayed awake. Yeah. Like I, <laughs> I mean, if you didn't, yeah. I, so our driver was a guy named Sutton and man, I love that guy. He was trustworthy and he was going to stay awake hundred percent of the time we had a, so it, just to give you kind of a picture of a vehicle. So I mentioned that Andy McLean is standing, he's a point out the left side of a one, one, three, it's the back hatch. So it's a large square hatch that you can fit multiple people sticking up the out, out the back of, um, I'm standing on one bench Andy's standing on one bench. I'm pointing the right side. Andy's pointing the left side. Um, we got Ferg, uh, Sergeant Ferguson is our gunner. He's on the 50 cal up front. Um, and then Sutton's our driver, but right before we leave, like literally it was like the day before we left, um, a reporter shows up. He's a reporter from the Dallas morning news. Oh. And so the battalion commander looks at Andy and I, he's like, he's going with you. And so now in our vehicle in between Andy and I sticking with our heads up, I'm pointing right. Andy's pointing left. We got a photographer. He's a, he's a photojournalist. So thank goodness I could say whatever the heck I want. He's just taking pictures. Um, 
but, uh, but he's a photojournalist and he's taken pictures. And I got to tell you, like, I don't think many people have this experience in any war, but when you have a photojournalist driving along with you the entirety of the war, like the, my war experience is very well documented. I know exactly, who, you know, I could show you what my picture was out of my vehicle. And actually it's really interesting because, um, and I'll, I'll go into this a little bit more later, but a lot of those pictures made the front page, like uh, Andy McLean's picture, front page of the news. Um, my picture standing on top of that one one three later front page of you know the it, my mom has a, a printout of the Fox News webpage with my oh, wow. picture and the and the dead center of it and and um, and Aunt, uh, David Leeson was the photographer's name. He worked for the Dallas Morning News, um, and he won the Pulitzer Prize for those photographs. And so. Um, my, I, I was funny thing. I'm not in many of the photographs. Actually, I'm in one of them. Um, cause it, it's multiple photographs that won the Pulitzer Prize, but, uh, my hand is in one of them. Um, so that's my claim to fame, I guess. My hand is in a Pulitzer Prize winning photograph holding an AK 47, which is really interesting. I'll tell you that story in just a bit. Um, <laughs> so, um, okay. So to get back to where we were, yeah. um, I'm in this vehicle, we roll North and a climactic March 20th. 72 hour road march and we get to our first battle. And basically where my battalion fights battles is we're doing this leapfrog up the Euphrates River is first in Anazaria, kind of right near the Talil um, airfield. Mm -hmm. And then we jump forward, we end up uh, kind of taking a right-hand turn uh, during the, the sandstorm. I'll talk a little bit more about this in a sec um, to a little town called Al Kifl and Kufa, these two little towns uh, there. And then we pushed up, we fought a battle in Karbala, but then our main battle was on April 6th um, in that was our push into Baghdad when we were, we were the tip of the spear for this forward forces in a, inside Baghdad. They kind of did the thunder run into the airport. And then we did kind of the left hook around them into the North side of Baghdad to kind of cut off, um, really cut off both forces that wanted to come into Baghdad, but also cut off the retreat from any forces that were trying to just push off and disappear to the North. So that was kind of the big major order of battle. Um, along the way, we, some of the experiences that I, I think are, are worth relating. Um, they're, they're kind of varied. So, so let me, the first one was really kind of surreal. So our first fight, this is the one, right, right. The army loves the rock drill. You're in the army, you know this. Yeah. Um, and so, <laughs> so the army loves its rock drill, its rehearsive concept, its sand table. We're going to plan the plan and then we're going to plan the planning of the plan. And then we're going to rehearse the plan. And oh my goodness, it was so we had rehearsed and planned this first battle over and over and over again. We knew exactly what we were going to do. And so we kick off our first fight just outside of Talil Air Base. And we had this exceptionally well-coordinated attack. I bring in two British um, tornadoes. They do a simultaneous strike on some vehicles that we had identified on the south side of Talil that we were afraid were going to jump the berm and cut us off from our left hook right around the airfield. We've got a smoke screen coming in to block site. We've got simultaneous artillery and aircraft overhead right as we LD. And the only problem that happened is we push in and the enemy forgot to show up. And so, <laughs> so we went into our first fight and man, we were ready. And there was not really anybody to fight. I mean, we were a long way from that Baghdad, right? Like we were, I mean, this was a place that I don't think any Iraqi thought this is a place worth defending and no one was, was holding them to it. There just was no enemy. Uh, and so we blew up a bunch of enemy vehicles that I think had been abandoned. Um, we, we, we saw shadows and we probably shot at them. We, we did recon by, by fire, uh, but basically we pushed around and our, our final objective on that day was a bridge as well. Um, and we got to that bridge really quickly, secured it really quickly and it, and that was it. That was my first war experience was this. I, I, the first time I ever said cleared hot was probably blowing up something inconsequential <laughs> in a really well-coordinated way. Um, and, and, but it was honestly, I look back and I'm like, wow, thank goodness. That was basically a really good practice because that was kind of the only time we got to practice from then on. It got very difficult very quickly. And so, um, so we fought that fight we hold the ground. The next guys pass us. They start to fight battles further beyond us. We sit around for a while and then we start push, pushing forward because we think our next battle, our next major battle is either going to be in like Nazaria or maybe push over to this town called Al-Hala, which is kind of direct to Baghdad. Yep, yeah. Or we're going to go up to Karbala and kind of do a bigger left hook where it's kind of the wait and see 
uh, methodology. And so, uh, so we start pushing that direction and, um, and we get into the Shamal. I don't know like how I, I'll just explain it because it's, it's just hard to understand. I would, I would reference you to a, to a picture actually in those Pulitzer prize winning photos the Shamal makes the world look like Mars. It's a sandstorm, mm-hmm. thunderstorm, rainstorm. But the biggest thing it gets is it just blows so much dust that you just feel like it's, I mean, it's just red all around. The visibility goes to absolute crap. And it's like, you feel like you can't do anything. Like you can't, you don't want to walk to the latrine. Like yep. you're afraid you're going to get lost between your tent and your vehicle. Um, it, it's, and so we, we can't come to this, you know, I think they called it a tactical pause. It, we just came to a complete halt, um, and just said, okay, we're, we're going to do nothing because we, the weather's just not going to let us do anything. Yeah. I, I went through one of those, uh, in, in my time in Iraq, it, it was definitely Mars. Like I remember taking photos of it. Like in, we were actually supposed to roll on a mission outside the wire that day. We got all kitted up. We get all ready to go. We started driving through post, get to the the flying man at Biap, and uh, we talked, dude, we're nuts. This is stupid. I mean, for, forget forget the the idea that it's going to be impossible to get where we're going and figure it out when we can't see anything. Uh, it's just a bad idea overall. Something was bound to go wrong. So we turned around and went back and called it a day. And we came in with this nice little coat of just <laughs> dust, orange yes. dust all over you. Yes. You were very happy with, I was very happy with my uh, Oakley shade, uh, Oakley uh, uh, goggles because, yeah. man, that dust was nasty. Yep. But so- So the problem though, was that one of the cav units that was off to our East was in contact uh, while the Shamal was going on and they weren't able to break contact. Then eventually they took some casualties. Um, They had lost a helicopter, which was forcing them to continue to press on. And so they were in kind of this bad situation. And so we had kind of come to this halt and we were sitting there and over the course of this night, it was getting tenser and tenser and tenser as we were tuned to and listening into the calves radios. Um, so we were hearing their comms back and forth and we just were realizing more and more that this was going badly. This was not. Um, and finally we got the call that they said, okay, drop everything, take a hard right. You're going to go link up with the calf. So it didn't matter that you couldn't see anything. It didn't matter how nasty the weather was. It, well, you weren't on a training mission. You couldn't say, forget it. It was the, Okay. We'll figure it out. Sure. And so we we manned up and we jumped in our vehicles and we, in very, very tight formation, started inching our way to link up with the calf. And so we we basically did kind of a hasty huddle with the, the leadership of the, the task force 269 armor um, and figured out, you know, who exactly was going to be in lead, what order we were going to do the march in, who exactly was going to go. We ended up deciding to take the whole task force. Um, and so in, in very close formation, we press out in the middle of the night, in the middle of this absolutely, you know, I say in the middle of the night, but I don't think it was night, but it felt like it was night. It was, um, I think it was the middle of the afternoon, actually. Um, we start driving and it is so hard to just keep sight of the vehicle in front of you. So we're moving very, very slowly. Um, and I jump on the radio and I just say, you know, it, it just makes sense to have, um, have top cover. I don't know how they're going to be, be able to help us, but I don't think there's a whole heck of a lot going on in this country right now. So I'm going to call and see if I can get some aircraft overhead. And so I jump on that satellite radio to call back to the ASOC, Air Support Operations Center. It's back in the rear. That's how we, how we requested air. I jump on the radio um, and... Uh, their response when I asked for aircraft is there is not a single airplane flying over the country of Iraq currently. Wow. Uh, what? I'm the air force guy, right? Like <laughs> what good am I going to do? Like, Oh, Holy crap. It was like, okay, I'm going to take this handset and I'm going to put it down now. Cause that's not going to do me any good. I'm going to make sure I've got this rifle well sighted and I'm going to be ready and, um, and I'm very glad that I did that um, because this was the first time that I ever personally got to be involved in combat when we're driving through a little town called Al Kiffel and we just start taking pot shots. It's like everybody and their brother has a gun and they want to just jump out of a building and shoot at you to see what they can get. 
It's not like organized. It's not like some assault. It's just random pot shots. And I think it's because one, we're moving so slowly. Um, and two, they think they're invisible. Um, and so I still remember, uh, I, I, like I said, I'm pointing out the right side of the vehicle and a guy pops out in a doorway and I mean, very hazy, fuzzy because I'm looking through the sandstorm and I'm looking at the muzzle flash of an AK-47. I realized this guy's shooting at me and I'm shooting back at him and one of us is going to die. And because of, I'm a better shot than him. I stand here today. Um, and I, I mean, but it was, it was, it was that fast. Um, it was the, I'm, I'm just looking out and then all of a sudden I'm defending me for my life. And then it's over like in that fast, I don't have time to process it or even realize what just happened. Um, and we, and we've moved on. Um, and I, what just happened? And I, it, it's just, everything's getting amped up, right? Like everything, it, it's making it more and more real. Uh, then in the process of this, all of a sudden we, we come to a halt because now we've become disconnected. We can't, we, people lost sight of one another. One, one, one guy trying to keep sight of the guy in front of him, the guy behind him, let, lose sight of him. Now we've become disconnected. We reconnect, we shoot at each other. Um, and we have a fracture site where it's a, it's a friendly fire incident ground to ground. Um, and so now we've got a casualty. So now we're trying to move forward. We got somebody injured. We're in the sandstorm. We're taking pot shots. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm pulling out my radio and saying, Hey, you got anything. And I remember realizing that this, it's like this epiphany came upon me when I was talking on the radio and somebody pops out and shoots at me and I shoot back while I'm like simultaneously transmitting. And I shoot the tenor of the voice of the dude on the other end of that radio drastically changed. I mean, it was all pessimism and there's no airplanes to be had to the, we'll get one to you, sir. We'll get it there as fast as possible. We'll, whatever it takes. Right. Um, and so um, it took a while. We, we moved very slowly. It took, I mean, probably a couple of hours, but the very first airplane that's, that flew is off the boat. It was an F-18 with one bomb. Um, why? Because he had, had to carry huge uh, extra gas because he had to be ready to divert to anywhere because the weather was that bad. Um, but, I, I, and it, and, but they just kept coming. And I think I was probably the only show in town because for the next eight hours, I, I had a constant coverage overhead of airplanes. And so we, we, we finished getting through Al Kiffel and we go to a little town that's kind of the next one up called Kufa. And that's where we, we do our link up. Um, and as we're doing our link up where we, that was the first time we kind of got, I, I would say ambushed. It was the, it was the first time we got like an organized attack against us, uh, our lead elements, in this kind of big warehouse-ish district, um, we get into this fight, um, and uh, hard to find the enemy. And I, I call up to the battalion commander and I, I "Hey, sir, I've got aircraft overhead. Um, I'm, I, I don't know how I can best integrate. Um, but what, what can I do for you, uh, commander?" And he says to me, "He says, look, I can take care of the fight, the close fight, but I can't handle if at this moment." This is the time that the enemy decides to push all the real major forces they have up in Hala and Baghdad. I can't handle it if they start pushing it down that road. So what I need from you is I need a bomb at regular intervals on that road as, a, as, as just a deterrent so nobody ever wants to drive down that road. And so I took the road from, from where we were up to uh, Hala, and I literally – just grabbed coordinates and I just moved the bombs around by small amounts and just kept dropping bombs for eight hours. I dropped a bomb every, wow. I don't know, sometimes it was every five minutes. Sometimes it was every hour. Um, it was just, it depended. I mean, I had one, I had a B-52 show up with like 40 JDAMs and I literally just spaced them out at intervals and I walked them up the road and I just said, Hey, we're going to make a big boom for a while now. So it, it, and he did literally one pass, 40 JDAMs, boom. Um, I think that was a pretty significant deterrent. And sure enough, I mean, at the end of that time, ain't nobody ever came down that road at us. Um, and so that was, that was really the first time I got to say, you know, I, I contributed to this battle. I had, I had done something that was exactly what my battalion commander had needed. Um, and, and we were, we were not in a great spot. Um, we were, I mean, that was a, it was a very difficult night. I mean, before we, we kind of came to a halt, um, 
we, we like I said, we were in that kind of industrial district. We fought a fight. Um, we kind of, everything kind of settled down, but there was very much this concern over, we are exposed. We are not in a great position here. Um, I remember, and this is, I mean, absolutely ridiculous. Like there's so many surreal experiences that I had from, from being over there. But, um, so one of the challenges of being a JTAC is I'm talking to the airplanes a lot. So I'm on a different frequency than the army often. So I have to flick over and actually, in my case, it was a different handset. So I literally had to hold a different handset up. I didn't have a cool that I actually didn't have the Peltor headset. Um, I, so I had to bring a different handset up to listen in on the army FM comms. And so oftentimes I just couldn't, like I couldn't listen all the time. So I'm controlling airplanes. I don't have the FM headset up. So what I don't hear is the fire in the whole call. And so they decided to bring out their engineers and blow a bunch of berms around us to basically create physical obstacles. Um, and if you've ever been in close proximity to C4, when it goes off to create a berm, um, it is like the, the earth explodes and you go up off of it for a period of time. Right. And I did not get that fire in the whole call. So I am sitting there talking to an airplane when this thing just absolutely explodes to create the berm right outside my vehicle. Holy crap. I thought the world had ended. Like <laughs> I scared the living daylights out of me. I thought the world was over. That's um, funny. and then I'm, I'm looking at Andy and Andy's laughing at me like literally, he's just like, ah. um, cause he knew exactly what was going on. And he knew they knew that it scared the crap out of me. He thought it was funny. Nice. So you get this um, experience and, you know, you're starting to feel like you have a better understanding of your job. As you get to April 6th, though, um, does that understanding, um, you know, sort of backfire is not the right word. Does it come into play? I mean, are you able to use it going forward? So I hadn't earned it yet. I had not earned the respect of my battalion yet. I'd, I'd integrated. I'd done something that was meaningful, but I hadn't earned their respect. So I want to tell you, let me, it, and it really just happened right after that is when I earned, earned the respect of the okay. army. And really, I, I would say was the turning point for me of when I went from that air force guy that's attached to us to no, no, now you're one of us. Um, and it's, it's a hard story to tell. Um, so, so it started off basically that next morning. Um, so we, we've just fought this battle. We've lived through a tense night. We all, and the next morning we kind of pull back, we set up a little bit of a talk area. Um, and it's basically in like a, a school building, which is effectively just a um, concrete structure with open windows. We walk inside and we kind of plan out, Hey, here's what we need to do. We need to extend our perimeter. We need to push out. We need to do some patrols and really start to, to, to push uh, our perimeter out because we're just in an exposed position. So we kind of come up with a game plan of, of that. Um, and as we're walking out from that meeting, um, we took incoming artillery. And um, I, if you've ever experienced it, you'll, this will ring true because I think it's true anytime anybody's ever done this. is When you have incoming artillery that's literally going to land amongst you, you feel it before you, it registered, like your body knows it. You can feel the air pressure change. You can hear the whistle before the explosion. And so it's, you just have this very split second warning before it actually blows up and the world rocks around you. And I remember that and just the absolute, holy crap, like Normandy, I'm, I'm about to die. And I was standing right by, they dropped the back of my, our back hatch of our vehicle and I dive into the back of our vehicle. The thing explodes right in the middle of all of us. Everybody just kind of dives for cover. Um, and, um, and we, and it's never just one round. So there's like four or five rounds come in and explode and we all, it gets quiet. You know, the dust settles, we all, everybody's kind of poking their head out. And I watch Andy McLean, Ranger Andy, this guy's been Ranger school. He's an artillery guy, but he's, you know, he's the epitome of army in my, in my view. Um, he walks over to the crater as he's looking around and realizing that nobody's hurt. And he looks at me and he goes, huh, it was fused wrong. And I'm, I'm just like, what? He's like, yeah, they were trying to hit us while we were inside the talk over there. Uh, so they delayed fuse it. And because it's rained so much, it buried in the ground. So all the shrapnel's in here. And he picks up a piece of shrapnel from this crater that we thought could have, I mean, literally was amongst us. Um, and, and not a single person was even injured. Nobody, none of that shrapnel went anywhere. Like 
there but for the grace of God go I. I mean, literally, it was feet from me. I was, I was dead. Like, it, it was the end. But I wasn't because it just embedded in the ground. And so, so Andy's, you know, he also looks around and says, we should not stay here because they're going to shoot again. <laughs> so we very rapidly push out from that area. And as we push out from this area, exactly like uh, the battalion commander had, um, had expected, we start to extend our perimeter. We start to run into the enemy again. Um, and as we run into the enemy, specifically as we're heading northbound, we are taking fire that we, we can't effectively respond to. Um, it's specifically coming from this brick factory. We send a kind of a patrol, a small group of people out to try to deal with it. Um, our scouts can't deal with it. We can't. And so it's, there's basically about a mile to our north. We can see it. We're kind of on a bit of a rise. We've come to a halt. And we're looking out at this brick factory, big, huge chimney out the top. And at that, at that point, the brigade commander had come up to be oh, basically wow. see what was going on with 269 armor. Um, and so we're sitting there with oversight on this. And they all look at me. And they say, all right, Air Force. All right, Purdy. How about you bring in a B-52 and you blow the crap out of that? And I was like, well, hell yeah. Okay, I'll do that. Uh, and so I jump on the radio. Hey, I need a B-52. They're still, they were, to be honest, the airplanes uh, were, were still, it was just the next morning. It was not a full ATO. We didn't have a ton of airplanes at that time. So um, so we had, I got a B-52 that showed up uh, you know, 10, 10 or so minutes later, and he checks in, and he, he's got dumb bombs. It's not Jeff JDAMs, nothing laser guided. It's just a bunch of Mark 82s. And I, I, I say to him, and, and everybody can hear this. Like I am literally, everybody's like gathered around me and they could hear my radio and they could hear them checking in. They know exactly what's going on. And I turn to the brigade commander, who is the one that's effectively saying, do this. Um, and I say, sir, I, I, I can't do this. He's got dumb bombs. They're just, it, it's, they're not going to hit. They're not going to, it's not, this is, it does not meet your intent. And he walks over to me and he puts his finger in my chest and he says, you drop those bombs. Wow. And I, I'm sitting there and I am, I just know in my heart of hearts, I'm just like, this is not the right decision. This is not what I should do. And I'm looking at this 06 and I just don't have the guts to say no. And so I, I do the best I can. I've got very accurate coordinates. I tell them exactly where it is. I give them the exact coordinates. I spread their bombs out so that they will, you know, if it's a little bit off, it's still going to have effects. Um, but we're sitting there and this B-52 comes in overhead and he says, in hot. And I say, cleared hot. And he says, bombs away. And it takes a long time for those bombs to hit. And just to, to kind of give you the picture of the way the battlefield set up, you've got where to the south. We're looking north, basically along a road. A brick factory, rather large brick factory, is um, sitting on the east side of the road. On the west side of the road is some, it's not residential, but there's some houses. There's some uh, kind of, you know, they're not very nice, but they're houses-ish. Um, brick factory, road, houses, the bombs land here behind the houses, just blow the living crap out of nothing. Um, and everybody looks at me with disgust, just absolute disgust. Like I have utterly failed. And I look at this brigade commander 06 and I just want to freaking hit him in the face. Like I am, I, it's, I just am, I'm pissed because I knew it was the wrong thing to do. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I, just pissed. And so we send another, I mean, they just, I mean, basically they just like blow me off. Okay. We're going to send some more. So we, we send another uh, recon out to try to figure out how we're going to approach this thing. They take a bunch of, they take fire from the um, brick factory and 27 people walk out of those houses bleeding from the ears, not dead. Thank God. But I had, I had literally caused so much pressure from 40, 50 bombs from a B-52 that they were bleeding from the ears. Oh, I don't, I mean, experiences like that, like, yeah, that's in my past. I have to live with that. 
Mm-hmm. That was a that was a bad decision. I so wish I could go back and change that. How did the, how did that solidify you in the eyes of people, or it didn't? Like the it eyes didn't of at the all. people in the battalion, it didn't at okay. all. So so here's what happened: the the brigade commander leaves, and I turn around to the battalion commander after they come up because they come back and they're like, "We still can't do this." They're pissed, and I'm like, "Sir, give me another chance, and let me do it my way." And I'm pissed, and he's like, "Okay, fine, do it your way." And so I call in two A-10s and I get two A-10s 10 minutes later to show up and they roll in over and over and over again. And everybody's still standing there and they're still watching. And this time they know this isn't what the army told the Air Force to do. This is what the Air Force said. This is what right looks like. This is how we were supposed to do this in the first place. Right. And I send two A-10s home Winchester. They both shot two Mavericks, two full pods of rockets, a hundred and uh, a thousand rounds of um uh, 30 millimeter each, um, and four Mark 82s each. In fact, one of them with a Mark 82 shacked the t- the chimney of this brick factory and knocked it over while my entire battalion watched. And everybody knew this is what Coke wanted to do the entire time. That is what gained me respect. When they realized that if you let him do what he knows how to do right, then, then he's going to do it right. And I still remember... And it's really, you know, it's, it, it was, it was transformational um, because the, the change was not just, um, it, it was visible, but it was also overt. The way I was treated from that moment on by the battalion commander was drastically different. So much so that I mentioned earlier that we had been in that fight the night before with this industrial area. Well, in that industrial area, there was a soda factory, um, soda factory, um, in a town called Kufa. And so the soda was called Kufa. Well, I don't know. You didn't, you didn't ask me earlier about my call sign. My call sign's Coke. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's not, I mean, there's no cool story to go with it. So it doesn't, (laughs) you know, it doesn't, it's, it's Coke bloker. It rhymes with my last name. It's cool. Cause I've got, I can wear Coke merchandise and look like I'm wearing my call sign. Um, but, but nobody in the army calls me Coke because on that day, the battalion commander looked at me and said, you're not pretty. We're going to call you Kufa. You earn that call sign. And so from that moment forward, I was Kufa. I was part of that unit. I was respected by every single person there. And I was an integrate, an integral part of every battle. Um, that is where I gained the respect right. that I had to, I, and I had to put it to use later on in, in our battle in Karbala, Karbala. I had to put it to use in our battle on April 6th, um, like you read about. Um, and, um, but for me, um, that experience, um, uh, was something I will absolutely, uh, I, you know, I'm so thankful for, and I will never forget because that's, that's the day that everything changed for me. And, and, right. and the perspective I now have on this entire experience is drastically changed from that, uh, from that moment. And it, it went from, you know, a, a bad decision to, you know, the absolute best thing that I could possibly happen. Um, so that, that was, that was a big deal. That was sure. a big day. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, so I want to, I don't want to spend, you know, too much time dwelling on this. Cause I know you want to, I want to talk about April 6th as well. I'm sure. Yeah, to, let's do it. To talk about donk. But, um, I want to tell a couple of stories along the way because I, I think I just need to express the ridiculousness of war, the craziness <laughs> of the experience that I was in. So it just bear with me and, and pause. Cause I just want to tell a couple of stories that are, I still look back on and go, what? Um, and so, so, so there we are. We've just fought this battle. We move up to Karbala. We fight a night battle in Karbala. It's the first time I ever called in somebody uh, danger close. First time I ever fought under NVGs where you see all the bullets flying, scares crap out of you um, because you can actually see how close you are to dying. Um, but after Karbala, we're waiting to fight the big fight in Baghdad, but we're waiting around, right? Like, so it's sequencing matters, right? So the timing of when we're going to take Baghdad International has to be timed and sequenced properly for then us to cut off to the north. And so we had a period of time where we're basically waiting around north of Karbala, waiting for the big fight. And this is when uh, basically three s- stories of ridiculous magnitude uh, uh, that just illustrate, I don't know, just the craziness of war, the craziness of death experience. So we, one day we go out on the small patrol and it's just the command element. So it's literally, it is the command commander's tank, my one, one, three, and one other tank. We just go out on a small patrol we, behind uh, friendly lines 
Um, and we drive out to what was kind of a suspected like depot. They're like, we think this is a weapons depot. We don't know exactly what it is. And so we drive into this depot and I'm looking around and they're like, what are these? And I'm like, I know, I know what those are. Those are SA-2 and SA-3 missiles, literally stockpiles of them, like hundreds of them, like a ton of SA-2, SA-3, all sorts of surface to air missiles, surface to surface missiles. And we had just happened upon them on like a tip. And so I'm like, uh, boss, can we like leave and just call in a bunch of airstrikes and just make this thing disappear? He's like, yeah, sure. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, sweet. So, I mean, literally I get on the radio and I'm, I, they're like, do you need to control this? I'm like, no, I don't want to be anywhere near this. I want, this is going to be a huge explosion. We're going to pull way the hell back and we're going to call in an airstrike on this thing. And my battalion commander was like, great, sure. Go for it, Coke. And so we're driving back. We're driving back from this. And, and, and he's just told me, yeah, I'm going to go blow up a bunch of these missiles. So I call in this strike. It's, it's inbound. Great. We're driving back. And I look over and we're, you know, multiple miles away from this thing, heading back to our, our, where our talk area is. And in this grove of palm trees, I see an SA-6. SA-6, that's the thing that shot down Scott O'Grady. Um, it is, particularly as an A-10 pilot, it's like my worst enemy, right? Like it is the thing that can shoot me down without warning, without, I, I, it's, it's the thing can reach out and touch me. And I say, no, those are my bros up there. Um, they're not this thing is not staying alive. And so I say to my battalion commander as we're driving back, hey, sir, um, there's an SA-6 over there. We need to neutralize that. I cannot leave this that on the battlefield. And he says to me, literally, so he's in his tank. He looks over me outside his vehicle, looks at me. So we're talking on the radio, but he's looking at me. And he goes, Coke or Kufa, you want to shoot it? And I was like, sure, sir. He's like, you want to shoot it with my tank? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and so he's like, all right. So he hops out of his own tank, calls me over. I jump out of my M113, walk over to his M1, A1 Abrams tank, points the tank at it, points the, the barrel at it. And I got to squeeze the Cadillacs and put a 120 millimeter multi-purpose anti-tank round in the side of an SA-6. And let me tell you, that's a big explosion. It was only like, it was, I mean, probably about 700 meters away. It was not huge, hugely far away. And I, I put it in the chassis and the chassis exploded. And then as soon as the chassis exploded, the missiles lit off and fired and exploded. Um, so this was this ridiculous, huge, we're, as this thing is blowing up, we're like running away because it's like explosion after explosion. Then another missile cooks off and another explosion. Um, it's a, I, there's a great picture on the internet actually of it exploding because David Leeson was there. So we took pictures of it. Um, but it was just, it was out of the blue. Like I got to shoot a tank and blow up an SA-6. Like what kind of experience is this? Which one of my peers are going to be able to do this? That's so awesome. Like who gets to do that? And so like, I'm on this high, right? Like this is the greatest. And then very rapidly after that, I'm scared out of my wits because I get back into my 113. We start driving back to our talk and we pass this guard shack, right? Like, so there's this guard shack of this, uh, of that same post that we had just been in this weapons depot, and Andy, sitting ne right next to me, he calls out the battalion commander and he says, "Hey, boss, uh, there's some mortars behind that. We can't let those be. We can't let those stay there." Um, and and battalion commander by this point is like, "Great, take care of them. I'll meet you back at base." So he takes off, and it is just me and Andy and our vehicle, and there we are. And Andy looks at me and says, come on. And I'm like, come on to do what? Go get the mortars. And he goes, you go clear the building. I'm going to go around back and get the mortars. I'm like, Andy, I'm in the air force. What? I'm, I don't clear buildings. He's like, go clear the building. I'm getting the mortars. I literally, I walk up to this. It's, it's just a shack, two doors, um, side by side, guard shack. And I literally think to myself, what do they do in the movies? Like, I'm going to take this. I'm going to kick in the door. I'm going to point my gun. If anything moves, I'm shooting it. Like, I don't know what the, why am I clearing a building? That's what I do. Kick open the first door. It's the little tree. Nobody's in there. Thank goodness. Kick open the second door. Nobody's in there. But there's a hot breakfast. Brit just recently cooked eggs. And an Iraqi uniform and an Iraqi AK-47. 
sitting on the bed? Uh, I was glad that guy was not there. I was glad that that guy had decided he was, he's going to be a naked Iraqi running around because he left his uniform and ran away. Um, <laughs> but I, I mean, it's just being in situations where you're like, how did I get here? Like I, I'm an A-10 pilot. Why am I doing this? Um, but that's, that's where I was. That's, that's what I had to live through. Um, and so that's, those are the ridiculous things that I went through as I lived through this experience. Um, and so, uh, so I, I think they're funny. I think they're illustrative of uh, some of the ridiculous uh, uh, ness of what I went through. Um, and I hope they're a little bit entertaining because uh, to be perfectly honest, when I look back at them, all I can do is laugh. Sure. Yeah. Um, but let's get to a- uh, April 6th because I think that's a, that's a big that's part. A big As I mentioned, it connects to, to a couple of other Hazard yeah. Ground guests that, uh, that have been here. Uh, and it's what got you awarded um, your medals, right? It's what, it's what got yeah. you awarded uh, your, your Bronze Star and your uh, Air Force Commendation Medal for Valor. So um, take me through the events of the day of April 6, 2003. Okay. So um, we knew that we were going to be the tip of the spear. Um, so we had had an opportunity to sit down and take a look at the map. We had a pretty good game plan. We knew exactly where we were going to be going. Um, we had, you know, put the right graphics on the map. We knew our, where everything, where everything was delineated. Um, the difficult thing that we knew that was, was going to be a challenge for us is as we got to the objective. So the final objective, objective Monty was on the North side of Baghdad. It was a bridge over the Tigris river. Um, and the way the sector lines were drawn was the Marines basically had everything on the east side and we had everything on the west. So even though our objective is a bridge, we're not going to cross the bridge. We're going to, it's effectively a bridge head on the west side of this bridge. That's a challenge. We'll get to why that's a challenge later. Um, but, um, but basically, in order to get there, there's urban terrain for us to go direct. So we have to press northbound. And if you, I mean, I, I, if you've ever been in Iraq, you know kind of the setup. It's most urbanish terrain you've basically got um in this case we had a road and on one side of it you had a berm and the other side you had a creek um or a, you know just a, a uh, irrigation ditch so there wasn't like there was no way to spread out right like we're in tanks and bradley's but you can't do like a big wedge formation to push in so we drop into column and so in this fight we've got you know, my, my battalion commander was kind of a bit of a cowboy. He was always at the front of the, you know, lead of the pack. That's why, that's why me being in that vehicle works so well, because oftentimes I was on those front lines. So specifically for this fight, um, we had, you know, lead Abrams of the lead company, company commander in his vehicle, battalion commander in his vehicle, and then me in the 113 with all the antennas sticking out the top. I called it a target, right? Like, I mean, the least armored vehicle there. And I was very close to the front lines and I realized how exposed I was and how, you know, suck it up though. We're going to war. This is what's going to happen. And so we're in column pressing up this road. Um, and sometime early morning, we do a uh, forward passage of lines where basically, you know, some other unit had kind of gotten to an X point set up shop. And now we were pushing through their front lines and now we were going into enemy territory where we knew, hey, we're going to run into a fight here. Um, this is not going to be, this is not going to be um, uncoordinated. This is not going to be just AK-47s. This is going to be uh, uh, an RPGs. This is going to be something significant. And we were right. Um, as soon as we went through the four passenger lines, we immediately start taking coordinated uh, fire. And uh, AK-47s, RPGs, but then the big thing is we started taking artillery. Um, and um, the we're we're driving we're driving we're northbound um and i knew, we had planned this so we had planned to have aircraft overhead and i had put in request after request after request it was the hey i don't just need a two ship i need everything you got um and i'd learned earlier that if you pull the trigger at the same time you request the aircraft they tend to just send them your way over and over and over again and so i put in all these requests and i just wanted anything and everything you can send my way and it turns out that we were the only show in town that day so um, aircraft just start showing up from the second we cross. Um, we, we get, you know, first two A-10s show up, 
first two F-15s show up. I'm sectoring the battlefield. Um, I've got an F-14 that comes in overhead. He's airborne, forward air controller qualified. So I can basically focus on just the fires while he can do the rack and stack of the aircraft as they're coming in. Um, and um, we, so we're coordinating between me on the ground and him in the air. Um, and we just start calling in strikes um, and strike after strike after strike. Um, and we're just, I mean, target rich environment. They're all, we can see them in front of us. There's muzzle flashes all over the place. So that even the aircraft, they're calling out targets to me before I can even see them. Hey, you know, five clicks ahead. There's another, I see, I see another artillery piece. I see a BMP. I see this. And so we've got all sorts of targets and I just, I literally can't get my aircraft in fast enough. Can't clear them hot fast enough. Can't blow up enough stuff. And I literally, I say to my battalion commander, I'm like, Hey, sir, Colonel Sanderson, can we slow down? Because I got, I got so much stuff in front of us uh, that I can take care of if we slow down. Um, and he says, all right, all right, Kufa, we're going to stop. You tell me when to go. Oh, okay, sir. <laughs> so we came to a full halt um, for the Air Force to prepare the battlefield. Um, and I'm, I mean, you can't, I can't get them to drop enough bombs. I've, I've, I've sectored them. I've sequenced them. I've got as many aircraft as I can get overhead and they're rolling in as fast as they possibly can, as fast as I can do the talk ons, as fast as they can find the aircraft. I, I actually watched the HUD video of one of the A-10 pilots that was there that day. Um, his wingman was a guy that I'd been through FTU with animal chill. Um, but I watched his and he almost killed himself. Um, because he was rolling in so fast, he wasn't gaining enough energy and, and extending from the targets. Cause he was like, Oh, another target. Got to get it. Another target. Um, and so he was, he almost killed himself by hitting the ground because he was so, uh, target fixated. Um, but in the process of this, the ground situation starts getting hotter and hotter. Um, I mentioned that we start taking artillery. Um, and so at one point while I'm controlling all these aircraft, I'm just so focused on what's going on. Um, that I, Ferg's realized that I'm not really covering my side of the vehicle very well. So he's shifting his field of fire. He normally kind of was forward and right. And he was covering the left side and I was kind of rear and right. Well, Ferg just kind of turns and kind of is covering everything over there. Cause I'm not really paying attention to using the gun in my hand. And even though targets are popping up right in front of me as well. Um, and it, at one, and then Andy grabs me on the back of my armor and he pulls me inside. And he's just, it's too hot. It's too hot. You're going to get hit. There's too many bullets. You're not, you're going to get hit. Um, and we're, you know, literally you can, you can feel the bullets going right over top of you. And, and at, like seconds after Andy pulls me inside an artillery rounds lands right behind our vehicle and it pitches us up into the air and we get, I get thrown forward and I hear Andy just yelling, go, go, go. And Sutton slams on the gas and just going as fast as we possibly can. We catch up all the way to the vehicle in front of us. He even runs into the tank in front of us to try to push him faster. And the artillery rounds keep landing right behind us, right behind us. And I'm just, every time one lands and pitches us forward, I'm just like, the next one's coming inside. Then like, it's over. This is the end. This this, the, this next round is, is, is all, all we've got. And it's, it's, it's fear. I mean, I, I, I I'm shaking as Were I'm telling the story. Were you surprised at how well they had you dialed in? Uh, no, because we're on a road. We're so constricted. Um, I'm just, okay. to be honest, I was really glad that by that point, my battalion commander was smarter than me and said, it's, we can't stay stopped for too long. We got to go. And so we'd started moving again. Um, because they, they had dialed us in and he knew that he knew that it was, it was going to get ugly, but I was, I mean, at that moment, as those artillery rounds are landing, I, you know, just that, like, I, I had just had to swallow down the fear and just do the, you know what, if this next round comes inside this vehicle and I'm done, then so be it, but I'm going to do my job to the very end and I'm going to do it as well as I possibly can. And so I remember like, I, I didn't really put my head out. I just looked up just enough. And right as I'm looking up, it just so happened that that pass was an A-10 literally coming right over top of us. And so I look up at an A-10 that was, I just watched his HUD, got all the way down to 50 feet right above us. I, it was, I was so close. I felt like I could touch him. Um, and he is hitting targets right in front of us while I've got F-15s over here that have sighted in those artillery pieces that are shooting at us and they're dropping bombs basically simultaneously. And I'm just like, I'm doing this, man. And I just swallowed, cleared hot. I'm doing my job. I'm doing it to the best I possibly can. And if this is the end, then this is the end. And 
It wasn't. We kept driving. Artillery rounds missed. We took out the artillery that was shooting at us. We keep pressing forward and we keep fighting because we, we basically were in contact from the moment we did our forward passive lines all the way to the objective. And it was, it was like 40 kilometers. Like it was not, this was not a short battle. Right. And it was, it was, and it was, it was a fight the entire way. So we, we pressed northbound and then the plan was as we executed, we take a hard 90 degree turn. As we take that hard 90 degree turn, I look around and that was, that was kind of the, the first time I had the full realization of the, Oh, I did all this. Cause everything was burning. Like right. every, like you, I saw like a line of artillery pieces off to the West and I'm like, Oh, those are the ones they just targeted. Yeah. Um, like it was, I mean, it's kind of a sense of pride, right? Like where I'm just like, yes, yes, that's how it should be. Um, and so we take a hard right turn. We start pressing towards, and we just continue to fight. We're still like, I, I can't possibly take care of all the targets because there's that many out there. And we get, we eventually fight our way all the way to objective Monty. And as, as the, the day wore on, the weather gradually deteriorated. Um, some of it was just kind of a cloud cover that was coming in, kind of a haze layer. But then added to it was battlefield smoke, just smoke and more smoke and more smoke. And it just, the visibility just went to absolute crap. Like right. you couldn't see anything. And it was just making it harder and harder. And so I started getting fewer and fewer airplanes because it was the, it's harder for me to be able to, they can't see the, they can't see the ground now that all of a sudden there's a bunch of weather. And so it starts to trickle down where I'm controlling very few aircraft. But that's about the time we're getting to our final objective. Well, we think, oh, final objective, we're done, right? Not remotely. And so as we get to the final objective, um, Assassin Company was our lead company, uh, company commander, this guy named Captain Stu James. Um, and he, he digs in right there along the river. And so the best, it, it, so just to give you kind of the picture from a, a ground point of view, if you li listen to Donks, you'll hear the air point of view of what this kind of looked like. Yeah, well, that's what I was, um, I was hoping we could get yeah. to, the connection between it all. Yeah. So, so we dig in and basically you've kind of got, so Tigris river is kind of a little bit down in a valley and then you've got kind of berms on both sides of the river. And then those berms come up and then they kind of come back down. So we're kind of behind, there's a little bit of a berm along the river, but it, what it really does is it makes it really hard to see the other side. Cause the same thing's true on the other side where it's kind of blocking your view of the other side of the, ri of the river. So we're looking across the Tigris. We're not supposed to, we can't just willy-nilly shoot. It's a restricted fire line. The Marines are supposed to be over there, remember? So they own that sector and we've got this bridge. And as you know about bridges, they kind of go up and they peek out and then they go back down on the other side. And so we're sitting there and we realize this is not an awesome position to be in. This is not, like we feel okay, but we're we're, we're a little bit exposed. We're not in an awesome position. And, um, and so we, we leave as my vehicle and the commander's vehicle. That's how I leave and pull back from that position. So now I'm not on the front lines anymore. I'm not sitting with that lead company. We pull back a couple clicks to the West and we start setting up our talk as our other elements start to get into positions, we, we're, we're trying to block to the north along this canal. There's a couple other smaller bridges across a small canal. We're blocking, um, trying to link up with some forces that are down to our south. So we're, we're, we're kind of arraying and we're, we're setting up our talk kind of in the middle of it. And that's physically where I am. And, and as we're setting up our talk, I get a call from Stu James on the radio. And he goes, hey, hey, Coke. Hey, Kufa. I need you. I, I, need, I need some air because I'm not in a great spot. I'm like, Stu, what's up? What can I do for you? Uh, he's like, well, I mean, we're black on fuel. I can't maneuver around. Um, I don't know when we're going to get resupply because this is not a great place for us to do resupply. We're not doing great on ammo. And, and the enemy's starting to shoot and it's, they're getting better at it. Can you bring in some air, aircraft to take a look and see what, I, I can't see the other side of this river. So when the army calls you as the air force and says, I need you, you know, you're on the inside. And so I call, I jump up, I call the ASOC and I'm like, Hey, um, I need, I need, I think the best thing I'm going to need is, is a tens, but really here's what's going on. I need something that can get below the weather. Uh, and so the ASOC comes back uh, and they say, hey, you got two a tens inbound. They'll be there momentarily. They'll be checking in, in just a second. So literally I went from, I, as soon as I asked for them, I got, them. and, and so Normally, when, when an, uh, you get a new set of aircraft on the radio, the first thing you do is authenticate with them. You make sure you're not getting spoofed by somebody that's jumping up on your radio frequency. You're making sure you're talking to the right people. They're the right people that are assigned to you and everything about it. 
there's a whole sequence that you do to go through that. Um, it was really easy in this case because you've talked to Donk. Donk has the most unique and obvious voice on the planet. <laughs> and so he jumps on the radio. My call sign was uh, on the radio was advanced three, three. He goes, you know, advanced three, three, this is D mob seven, one. And the most distinct voice you've ever heard. And I'm like, Donk, it's Coke. Let's do this. And he's just like, I mean, the, there is a, and I, you know, I just want to pause for just a second between JTAC on the ground and close air support aircraft in the air, the moment you check in, you start to build trust. You start to build a rapport where you know, okay, I'm capable at my job. I know what's going on in this area of operations. I know what the threats are. I know where the targets are. I know, I, and, the, and the pilot's saying, I, I, you know, I'm, I know my procedures. I know what, what the right questions to ask. I know what you're talking about. And you just build this rapport and this trust. In that specific case, on that specific day, the trust was there in an instant, right? This was my bro. Like mm -hmm. literally, Donk was my director of operations. He, was, he, he ran operations in my squadron. And on his wing was Billy Bob Thornton, the dude that I'd sat in his office to get told, I'll see you in Baghdad. It had all come true at that moment. And so there I am, Donk, it's Coke. Let's do this. Um, and, and so I am, I'm a little bit excited because it's Donk, but I'm also a little bit concerned because now I know I don't have eyes on the target. So I go back to call Captain James and say, okay, I need you to describe for me what you're seeing so that I can pass to the aircraft. So now I'm being a relay. So I'm talking to the guy that's actually got eyes on. He's explaining to me and I'm passing it to Donk. And so I'm trying to be very clinical. I'm trying to be unemotional and I'm trying to get the right information across to him in a rapid fashion. At that moment in time where I physically was in the talk, we get ambushed. So while I am trying to fight a fight and visualize something in my head, all of a sudden off my left side, we've got a organized attack on supply lines. And the thing that they hit is a uh, gas tanker truck and our ammo truck. And so literally like a very short distance away from me, I've got a burning tanker truck and people trying to save the lives of the guys that are in, that are driving that truck and an ammo truck on fire that starts cooking off ammo. And we are trying to reposition, move our vehicles. So I am simultaneously trying to return fire and stay aware of what's right in front of me while I am trying to have situational awareness on a fight that is very, very important and urgent, but I can't physically see. And I know that the tenor of my voice just went up and uh, as I was getting more and more just task saturated by everything that was going on and just, holy crap, this, this is getting bad really fast. Um, and so I, I just jumped on, Donk, we need you in here right now. I need you now. This is not a, you know, this is not a gradually find your way under the weather and find this. This is a get your butt in now. Um, and it just, I mean, you know, you kind of get some, some temporal distortion of how long things happen. I got to watch their HUD video afterwards and it wasn't that long, but it felt like an eternity of how long it took from when they first checked in and I gave them basically a talk on, on a map because that's the best I could do. I had a map. I knew they had the same map in front of me and them that the same map in front of them that I had in front of me. So I'm talking them onto this bridge using features on this map and then correlating and saying, this is what you're going to see outside. You're going to see this, uh, this berm on the west side of the river. All friendlies are on the, uh, on the west side of the river. And so also associated with this, as Donk is coming in, I'm coordinating with the ASOC because the problem is, is that I want to put fires on the east side of the river that is not in my sector. I can't shoot at anything because there could be friendlies over there. And as, if there is one thing I knew from day one, from the very get-go, as an A-10 pilot and as a JTAC, is that you keep track of all friendlies, not just your own, but all friendlies. And so I jump on and I talk to the ASOC and, and find out, hey, I need to know exactly where the Marines are on the other side of the Tigris River because I've got enemy over there that I need to kill, but I need to make sure that, that is, this is not going to cause them problems. And so 
I'm waiting for to get clearance to be able to say cleared hot to Dunk and Billy Bob. I'm bringing them below the weather and they're taking the, the time that they need to cut through the weather because like I said, it's just, it's just crap. And that it, there was a cloud deck, but the deck wasn't as much the problem as it was just the visibility. You just couldn't see. I mean, I'd, I said we pulled back from like, uh, it was probably a couple miles away. And later on when, when they, when they finally get over the target area, I can see the aircraft, but not well, like it's just hazy between me and them. Um, and so I bring them in, thank goodness, they drop below the weather and they're able to use the river as a funneling feature. So they find the Tigris river and they're flying up the Tigris river from South to North. And I think the first pass was just donk and I'm talking him on and explaining what he's going to see. And he starts seeing things. Um, he does his, I think his, his first pass, he wants to do a, a mark. He wants to make sure that he's got the right target as well. He should. Um, I finally get uh, clearance. Hey, Marines are well out of range. You've got, basically they gave me effectively 10 clicks. I got 10 full clicks all the way on the other side of the river. I'm good. So I know, okay, no friendlies to worry about on the east, east side of the river. So I'm like, donk, friendlies are on the west side. Enemies on the east side. Stu James is calling me up and he's saying, I'm taking effective tank fire they are in some sort of old Russian tank and they're shooting at me and I can't find them to shoot back. I'm in the worst spot I have ever been in Coke. I need you to fix this for me. And I, and Donk's going in he says, Hey, I, I need to put this mark down to make sure I got the right bridge. Instead, his rockets hang. So he can't put down the mark, but I can see him. And I get, you're over the target right now. And he's dropping flares. I'm like, you're dropping flares over the target right now. Um, and so he's off target. And I know he's got it. I know he's on the right target. And so, as I mentioned earlier, that trust, like that I'm building trust with them, where I know what he's seeing is what I'm seeing. What, the, what Stu James on the ground is looking at is the enemy. I know he's found it. And so I say, um, don't get back in here as fast as you can. You have found the target area. Friendlies are clear. You are cleared to engage. That's the terminology we, we use nowadays of how you are allowed to just attack over and over and over again, as many times as you can roll in. I want them to go home with no bullets on their jets. Um, and so, so he starts the process of rolling in multiple times. He calls in Billy Bob after him. I'm returning fire in this ambush we've got. We pull out, we take one casualty uh, from, from locally, we, uh, you know, heroic act of one of our lieutenants running out and saving this guy out of the ammo truck. We got ammo cooking off. We're pulling back. We, as we back up in our one, one, three, we slam into a light pole. And so we've got this full size, you know, two, three story metal light pole that's falling over on top of my vehicle while donk is calling in. So I'm guiding a light pole as it's trying to fall and kill me while saying cleared hot on the radio. And I just barely guide it. So it falls off the edge of my vehicle and it takes my HF antenna and it just snaps it in half. And I'm I, praising God that the HF radio at that, my SATCOM was working. So I didn't need my H, HF. So I said, well, that's the loss, but I'm just going to write it off. I can still talk to airplanes and I can still ask for more. I'm good. Um, and we we're repositioning so I can focus on really what's happening over any uh, on the air to ground battlefield as opposed to what's right in front of me and i'm and so donk rolls in over and over again billy bob rolls in over and over again and they i, I don't even know how many passes and like i said time distortion makes things go kind of slow i think they but said they, it was between 12 and 14 if i remember correctly that's pretty quick but i i mean they said it was I mean, fast like it was it was it was that many that quick like that they they recalled how uh it was how quick they had to move in a, in a short amount of time to be able to to be able to provide the cover that was needed yes and and so and then of course like so the problem was is like they're using the river as a funneling feature and and just in order to help them funnel in i basically said hey go south to north and so they come back at me like Hey, can we go north to south as well? And I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Because the problem is, is the more time they spend over the target area, the more of a of a target they are, the more that they're getting shot at. And so as mm -hmm. I start to see, the more they start to roll in, I'm taking note of, oh, that's that's triple A, okay, triple A to the south, okay, okay, it's not it's not good triple A, it sucks. They're not they're not they're just shooting at the air. They're not shooting at airplanes. They can't see what they're shooting at. 
and I'm looking for Sam launches, right? Because I know the thing that is probably the most dangerous to Donk and Billy Bob at this moment is a man pad. I know that the thing that can reach out and touch them without any warning is the um, shoulder launched um, infrared seeking, I'm going to go find your engine. I'm going to blow it up without you ever knowing it, man pad. And so I'm looking out because I know that I've got to be on the radio to say break left flare. Um, and, and I might be the one to, to save their life if that happens. And so I'm constantly scanning. I'm watching AAA. I'm calling them back in. And, and, and eventually they get to the point where they're like, hey, Coke, we're bingo, man. We're out of gas. I think they probably pushed it. They were probably way, way bingo over where they should have been. Um, thinking about, you know, diverting to Talil. They, they, you're going to have to listen to their story to hear about exactly how they, they came up with that decision. But they basically said, hey, we put a bunch of, a bunch of ordinance down. We've done the best we can. We got to get out of here. We're out of gas. And almost simultaneous to that, Stu James jumps on the radio to me and he's like, Coke, K- Kufa, they're done. They're not shooting anymore. We're good. Yeah, the fire's gone. You guys did an awesome job. That's exactly what I needed. I, you, I mean, I, you, can, you can hear it in my voice when I check out with Donk and Billy Bob. They, just the, the sigh of relief, just the breath of, ah, oh, they're alive and they're headed home. The, the, the army is, is supported. It's, it's the culmination of everything you ever wanted to do. Like the, the, my, my wife said it best. Um, when she said that my prayer for you, that when you went over there and when you did this thing is that you'd be busy and that you do exactly what you were called there to do. Because the worst thing that could happen is to go and have no effect. The worst thing to go would be to just go have an experience, but not do anything of consequence. Right. And that, that was, I, I knew it. I knew that that was a, that what we had just done was of great consequence. Um, and, and what I had done that day was important. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't the end of the story. Um, the Donk and Billy Bob left and they get to go home and they get to, you know, fully let their guard down. I didn't get to fully let my guard down. Right. Like, so, I mean, as soon as they leave, the next thing I'm trying to do is I need to bring in another set of aircraft because I don't know what's going to happen next. Like he's really happy right now. We think we're good, but you think you're good right until you're not. And so I'm calling in, Hey, I need, I want two more A-10s because we're still having problems with weather. So I get two, two more A-10s on board. Right. Um, Immediately after that, I'm talking, doing the same exact thing. Hey, here's the target area, giving you a map talk on. I need you in here as fast as possible. I don't know what's happening right now. Right now it's a static situation, but I don't know what's going to pop up. And I realized they're going to have a really hard time. We had a, we had a difficult time making sure that Donk found this target area. So I'm going to go ahead and do that mark. I don't have time to wait for them to come in and, and make sure that they've got the target. I'm going to do a mark. So I call up my FSO brother and say, Hey, can we get a coordinated attack with artillery? Can we put down some marking rounds to mark exactly where this bridge is, drop them on the West side, make it obvious, right? As my aircraft are about to come in so they can get positive identification of this target the first time right away. Um, and so I'm coordinating, I'm actually coordinating with the, uh, NCO at this time. And he's like, yeah, yeah, that sounds great. Let's coordinate it all. Let's do a time hack. We'll figure out, we're going to do it. And so I, we said, we figure out exactly when the guys are going to be overhead. We figure out exactly when we need to shoot the, the artillery. And these guys are coming in. Time hack's just about on. I call up the NCO. I'm like, all right, I need, to call, I need you to call your last splash. Call your last splash so I know exactly when. The target area is clear. There's no more rounds in the air. So I know my aircraft are safe. They'll be in right after that. And he's like, my last splash will be in six minutes. I'm like, what? It's a marking round. He's like, nah, we just, we decided to do a call for fire. We're just going to shoot for a while. I'm jumping on the radio, abort, abort, abort. I, I've got rounds in the air, the same place I'm trying to bring airplanes. I am absolutely pissed. I have, I have just tried to do a co- coordinated attack where your artillery, which is not going to actually kill anything is just marking. And what you've chosen to do is just shoot willy nilly on a bunch of targets that I've already killed. I was pissed. So I abort my aircraft. They say, Hey, we don't have enough time to just hold and let you figure this out. We're pressing home at this time. 
I get out of my vehicle and I walk over to that NCO and I throw my helmet at him. And I, if somebody hadn't grabbed me, I probably would have hit him in the face. I was pissed. It, it rounds in the air when I'm bringing aircraft over overhead. This is not big sky, little bullet. Maybe it'll work out. No, we do this right. I was pissed. And so I get grabbed, they pull me away. And I, I mean, I just know at that moment and everybody can, I'm just, you know, I'm uber tense. Like I am, you know, every muscle in my body cannot, you know, relax. I am, I'm both angry and I'm overwhelmed and I haven't slept and I haven't taken a break and I've been controlling aircraft for hours and hours and hours on end. And I, I just remember my battalion commander coming over to me and just kind of, just kind of put his hand on my shoulder and just say, Nakufa, it's okay. You did great. You're doing great. Mm -hmm. Take a break. Just take a break. We don't, it, it's, things are settling down. We, we don't need airplanes in here right now. Just take a break. Do you think the stress got to you? I think everything got to, I mean, it was, I, it's just, I mean, I can still kind of like just, you know, that, that tense feeling like you, I can still kind of, my muscles remember it, that, that like, I mean, like the claw I'm grabbing onto this microphone with and my gun with and um, just absolutely incredibly tense running on adrenaline for hours on end. Um, you know, I, my, vo my voice was hoarse from just constantly talking because um, I just, I mean, nonstop. It had just been hours and hours and nonstop. And it's not like I'd slept well beforehand in preparation for this. I'm sure I was ridiculously nervous and not sleeping well ever. Um, but I was just, I, I mean, just uber tense. And I, and so at that moment, what I did was I, I, I actually on the, on, on the, I would say order of my battalion commander, he just said, Hey, just go talk to the chaplain, go take a break, like just whew, take a breath. And so we were in this, um, it was like this oil headquarters, like big conference rooms and, and office building type of thing. And I actually walked inside the building and just sat down on a couch that was randomly in there. And the chaplain sat down with me and he just prayed with me. And I just was able to just, just bring it down a notch, right? Like just mentally and physically just take a breath and decompress enough and realize that it was going to be okay. And I just, you know, that, that come down off that adrenaline high that, and I, I just wept, man. I was yeah. just, I just lost it. And just the, I mean, a, the, the chaplain that just, he's a, a Polish guy that was really hard to understand the words he's saying. So I don't really know what he said, but he just, he had his hand on my shoulder and he's just reassuring me that it, you're doing good. Like everything's good. You know, you have, okay. uh, you've said that, you know, you, you finally got to a place where you could talk about your experiences in Iraq. And I mean, I, look, again, it's hard to encapsulate the following 20 years of your career uh, after after April 3rd, 2003. But um, why do you think you're so much more capable to talk about it now than you were in years past? So um, some of it is time, mm -hmm. just letting time pass. Um, but I had... I had a, a, a very eye-opening uh, kind of moment um, and I'll just jump ahead to it because you asked the question and I can get back to other, quite other, other stories if you want me to, but so fast forward over 10 years, um, it's 2014 and I'm an IFF instructor at Shepard Air Force Base and on a out of the blue I told a couple stories to a couple old guys and my vice wing commander had been in the room at the time. So he kind of knew my story of what I'd done in Iraq. And we had a, a, a wingman day for the entire wing. And the guy, our keynote speaker that was supposed to be a Vietnam Medal of Honor winner or something like that. And he had had to cancel last minute out of the blue. And my vice wing commander turns to me and said, Coke, we don't want to cancel this day. Can you tell your story? Um, and I'd never, I'd never stood up in front of an audience and told my story. I had, I'd come back from Iraq. Um, and I knew that I was, wasn't able to talk about it. I was a little bit broken. Um, I, I unloaded on my wife. Like I, I came back and I spent hours and hours on the couch telling her every story. And all she did was just love me 
and not judge me and just listen. And that's exactly what I needed, like to just process through that initial stuff. And I sat down with my pastor of my church and he was able to help me kind of identify and label things as just ugly, as just bad, um, and be able to get to a point where I could accept, um, you know, <laughs> what I had done and what I experienced. I'd done kind of those, those initial counseling sessions that I kind of think I knew, I knew I needed with my, with my pastor and with my wife, but I hadn't, I hadn't gone deep enough. And I'd kind of come up with my coping mechanism for a good 10 years was just to not talk about it. It was just to ignore it and to just repress it and to just push it down and to not think about it. And I did that effectively for years and years. Um, and I kind of looked around and I said, I don't think anybody else is dealing with this. So I'm not going to talk about mine. Um, and so it took my vice wing commander asking me to stand up and in front of the entire wing and Coke, would you tell your story? Would you stand up in front of this large group of fighter pilots that you have, I, I, I by that point I had been stationed there for almost three years. I was actually, when he asked me to do it, I had already been chosen and was going off to be the director of operations of a JTAC squadron um, at Fort Hood. I knew that from the moment um, actually from the moment that KC Campbell got hit, and I can go back and tell you that story if you want to, from the moment that KC Campbell got hit and the situation that, that was surrounding that, I knew I wanted to be a JTAC squadron commander, that I was trained as an A-10 pilot, but my passion and my calling was in the TACP community. I was a tactical air control party member far more than I was an A-10 pilot. And so I had always wanted to go back to leadership there. And as I was being chosen and being sent to go back to that community, simultaneously to that in 2014, I get asked right before I leave my previous wing to stand up in front of everybody and tell my story. And I stood up, I threw together some slides of, cause I like the weird thing is right. I've got pictures of everything. Um, they're, they're, you know, they're not owned, not owned by me. They're owned by a, a photo journalist at the Dallas morning news, but I've got these amazing pictures. And so I just threw them up there and I just start talking through the story and I start telling the story much like I told you. Um, but at that po point, it was much more raw. It was much more, I mean, and, and I, I, I cried my eyes out. I stood up on that, on that um, stage. I've got pictures of me standing up there with a microphone in my hand and a picture of me. And I've got this amazing picture of an A-10 in the background and me in the foreground looking up as the JTAC. And, and I, I told every story. Some of them were the hilarious, ridiculous ones, like shooting and blowing up an SA-6 that everybody thought was awesome. And some of them were telling the stories of fear and, and swallowing that fear to be able to stay cleared hot when I thought that it was the end of my life. And I, I, I told the story for the first time in the most real, raw way that I possibly could. And I just decided I'm going to be as authentic. I'm going to be as, as personal as I, and I'm just going to pour it out in front of all of these people that I knew quite well. And I'm going to pour my heart out in front of all of these student pilots because they needed to know. And I cried my eyes out and I loved it. And I realized afterwards as person after person after person came up to me and said, I've got a similar story and I haven't talked about it either. I've been through stuff like that. I, I remember that day. I was there that day. I think you controlled me that day. And I over and over, I had pilots come up to me and say to me, that was you sharing was so meaningful to me, I need to do the same. And all of a sudden I realized that my story was powerful, that my story shared with others could be the thing that unlocked theirs. And so I left that assignment and I went to the next assignment. And I remember literally the first day I checked in with my group commander, he said, he calls me into his office He's an 06 group commander. And I'm literally, I checked in for the very first day just to introduce myself. And he goes, hey, I come into my office, um, clear my calendar. I'm going to talk to Coke for a while. And, and he says, hey, your, your wing commander called. And he said that you've got a story that you need to share with me. And on the day one, I've never met this man in my life. He's, he's going to be my new boss. I'm going to be a DO in one of his squadrons. And he says, please tell me your story. And I tell him my story. 
the entire story. And it takes a while to tell. It's, I mean, it's, it's not a, a one hour long story to tell the whole thing. And I just say, I'm, hey, I'm going to do this. And I authentically and fully share everything that I went through. And he says, ah, dude, I know exactly what that feeling is. I remember that feeling of fear. I was a backseater in a B1 over Kosovo. And I remember when they called missiles in the air and we had this thing called the duck on the back and we didn't know if it was going to work. And I remember the time that I grabbed my chair and I waited to see if I was going to die. And it worked and I didn't die. And I remember that fear and I still carry that fear to today. You're the first person I've told that story to. And, and to see how my story opened up his story and his willingness to go seek help. And then I got to, he gave me the opportunity to stand up in front of every single squadron at Fort Hood, every single Air Force member at Fort Hood, and to tell my entire story in front of a bunch of JTACs. And let me tell you, my story is in front of JTACs is, it's difficult to tell because when I talk about the toll that it took, that, that the fear that I went through, the death that I had to experience, the problem, the great difficulty that I went through, the reason that I have the trauma that I experienced more than anything else was that I wasn't prepared, that I, it wasn't something that I had trained for. It wasn't something that I had I had wanted that I had desired that I had worked for. It was something that I was thrown into. And so this experience on the front lines, while every other JTAG, it's the, their goal. It's what they train for and what they want. For me, it was, we're supposed to look like a video game in my HUD far away, but it didn't. It smelled like blood and sweat and piss and a rack. And it was very close and I wasn't ready to experience it. I wasn't ready to deal with it that close. And it, it took a toll on my soul. And, it, and I didn't know what to do with these memories, all these stories of I, I had taken lives. I knew what a Mark 82 crater looks like. I know what it looks like to put a Maverick missile into a BMP and the flames that come out of it. I know what a 30 millimeter round does to a human body. I know those things. I can't get rid of that. Those are in my head forever. What do you do with those memories? What, how do you deal with those memories? And, and, and all these JTACs, as I'm telling these stories to, they say, that's, that's what I want. That's, the, that's what I'm training towards. But, but my answer to them is that, yes, it is noble. It is good. What I did was important, but it takes its toll. It takes its toll on who you are. And so what I began to preach as I started to tell my story was, one, you need balance. You need balance in your life. You need to know your purpose. You have to have your purpose very core and foundationally set so you know why you're doing this. For me, it solidified my faith. That, that's, that's what it did. It solidified what I believe about God, what I believe about why I am in the military, why I do what I do. It solidified my belief in Jesus Christ. I have no, I have a very firm foundation of what I am called to do and who I am called to be. It's this solidified that for me. And I, and I said, I, and I still say to my airmen, I don't know what it is. Yours is probably different than mine, but you have to solidify your why, why you do this, why you're in the military. What is your purpose? But you need balance. It's not just about that. You need all those pillars. We talk about it in, in the air force. It's comprehensive airman fitness. It's a, it's a stool. And if you take out one of the, one of the, the, the the stool legs you're gonna fall over it's gonna get wobbly and so you also need that physical fitness because it's not like I was doing PT while I was over there I was trashing my body eating nothing but MREs working out never staying up ridiculous hours living on adrenaline on 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 the tense pressure of of all of it if I wasn't in good shape beforehand I would not have been able to physically deal with that you have to have your physical fitness in amazing shape because when you're called on, you're going to rely on that. So you better be in good shape. You need balance. You need a spiritual pillar. You need a physical pillar. You need a mental pillar. You have to have, you have to always improve. You have to always get better. If I hadn't spent two months in the sands of Kuwait, spending every day trying to figure out how to fix that radio, how to get better, how to integrate. If I hadn't have pitched myself into that fight, like my life depended on it because it did if I hadn't wanted that self-improvement 
and to challenge myself to be the best version of myself I possibly could, I would never have been able to live through this. So I challenge my airmen even today, and I will challenge my airmen as I go to my next assignment to be balanced, to have mental, spiritual, physical fitness, as well as the last pillar is just as important. So spiritual, mental, physical, and social is what they call it. For me, I call it community. You, I have to be surrounded by people that can walk with me. Because one of the reasons, and you asked this question, I'm so glad you asked the question of the, how did you get to this? And why did it take so long? Because when I came back from Iraq, I felt alone. I felt like I was misunderstood. I got back into my A-10 squadron and I didn't know how to talk to people about this experience. There had been, I, I, everybody had gone through combat Everybody had gone through, but I, what I realized is that me as an officer on the front lines, having called in all these airstrikes, I had been through something that was just a little bit different and I didn't know how to talk about it. And I, and I didn't know how I could get other people to relate to me. And instead of bringing in those people and bringing in a community around me and relying on those others around me, I pushed them away. And the only person I relied on really was my wife. And if she hadn't have been there, I probably would have been crippled, but she was an amazing just listener. I relied a little bit on my pastor to kind of get me through those kind of initial processing. But I remember coming back and, and I, I basically wanted people to leave me alone. I went on, so my wife and I went on this cruise right when we got back. I literally, I got back and within three weeks, I was on a cruise ship to the Virgin Islands. It was surreal, weird. Like I'm, I've just been in war and now I'm in, but we would go to the, to the dinners and they would put you with other people at the table and they would ask you, oh, why are you on the cruise? Is this your honeymoon? Is this your, because I was still really young and with my wife there and they're, oh, is this what? And I would say to them, no, this is my, I didn't die in a rack cruise. <laughs> they would like end every conversation. Like they didn't know what to say. Like, and I, that's all I wanted. Just leave me alone. I, did I don't want to talk about this. For the record, I did one of those. After I got back from my and, first deployment, I took a cruise. Yeah. So yeah, but celebration. The, the thing is, for me, I, I mean, it was, it was good in that it gave me, you know, time alone with my wife. Yeah. It gave me time to decompress and she was an awesome and amazing counselor for me. And that's what I needed. But, but it was just another thing that I point back to and say, that was me pushing the world away. That was me wanting to figure out how can I repress this stuff and me not leaning on that social pillar of the people around me that cared. And this is, this is, I, I, I alluded to this earlier, but I didn't want to get into it then, but I'll, I'll jump into it now. And this is something that just was a, a jaw on the floor moment for me is realizing that I had been through post-traumatic, I had been through combat trauma mm -hmm. and I had post-traumatic stress as a result of it. And so did my mom, um, th that I had spent this war in the back of a 113 fighting tense, adrenaline running through my body, doing the job, very, very busy. And my mom had spent this war following me on the front page of the Dallas Morning News, scared for the life of her son. Yeah. Scared out of her mind. And she could do nothing other than pray. That's all she could do. And so she spent it on her knees and I spent it scared for my life, but just you know, shielding myself, but just throwing myself into my job. And so she had been through that same combat trauma that I'd been through. She had some of the same issues to process through that I did. And I couldn't even talk to her about it. Like she wanted me to tell her these stories and I just couldn't, like, I just couldn't with my mom go through it. And so I even pushed her away and she had problems processing. And so, so I, I mean, I, I feel like I've learned so much, but it's taken me so long to learn some of these lessons of how, and the way I say it is, is how do you have post-traumatic stress and don't let it become post-traumatic stress disorder? How do you make it so that it doesn't own you? <laughs> how do you deal with it in a healthy way? And I can tell you that, that for me, for a long way, I didn't deal with it in a healthy way. The thing that really helped me to start to process this in a healthy way was to start to share my story with others like I am today and share my story in a way that that was meaningful to others. And so particularly as I transitioned really kind of out of the A-10 community and into the TACP community, as I got into being a DO at Fort Hood and then being a commander at Fort Carson and leading JTACs, 
that all of a sudden I felt like these are my people. These are the people that understand me. And these are the people that I can be my authentic self with. I can open up to. And I, and as I started to tell my story more and more, I started to get more and more acceptance. And I started to build a community that I started to let in more. Um, I started to to share with more. And I started to have those conversations of the, oh, you've been, you've been in that situation too. Tell me your story. Cause I want to hear your story. I can, I can tell you mine if you want, if you want to hear it as well, but, but I can hear you and I can see you and, and it's real. And so now one of the things that I see is one of my absolute missions. Cause I mean, you said at the very beginning of this story, I am still in the air force. I am a Colonel in the United States air force. And my next job is to lead the vast majority of the JTACs in the Indo-Pacific. That's going to be my job. And I am so excited about that job because I get to take care of people. I get to say to them what I, I think the Air Force tries, but nobody believes, which is that I am your leader and I, I am here to break a stigma. I am here to tell you that you can get help. You can take a knee. You can go get mental health help. You can go say, I'm not okay, and that's okay. And my job as your leader is to give you the space to give you to let you get that help. And then when it's time to get you back in the fight. And, and I, because I can tell my story of how I needed to do that same thing, I can say to you, trust me, I'm with you. Yeah. Trust me, I will help get you back in the fight. Trust me, you can get help and you can get back in the fight. And I know, I know this is happening more and more in the Air Force. I just read an article the other day about a, uh, an F-15 uh, backseater that, that's telling his story of, of needing to get mental health help and how he had to take a knee for a period of time and how he's back in the jet and he's back fighting and he's, and he's back in the fight and how meaningful that is. And as we get more and more leaders in the United States Air Force that need that we need to continuously say, it can't be something we say once, it's something we have to say over and over again, that, that is that, trust me, I'm on your side, you can get help, I will help you get you get back in the fight. If you need to take a knee, I will, I will take a knee with you, I will help you get the help you need, and we will get you back in the fight. And that that's part of my mission. I will preach resilience, I will preach balance, and I will say I will be that leader for you. And and the, the thing is, and if you want to, I can get back to tell the full story of how my story intersects with KC Campbell. Uh, but it intersects a little bit here as well, because that's one of the things that KC is doing now that I absolutely love. Because I had to deal with, and if you don't mind, Mark, I'm just going to take the time to tell a little bit, just enough of KC's story, because mm -hmm. I think it's really important. Because um, her story happened on April 7th. So if we can go back in time to April 6th, all the stuff that happens, I take a break. I go cry my eyes out. I go inside and I spend some time decompressing. I go sit in my vehicle and I listen as my other two JTACs control airplanes for the entire night long. I go back inside for a few minutes in the morning. I wash my face. I sit down. I take a nap for just a short period of time. And I walk out on the morning of April 7th. And the, that is the moment when, when my life vector of where I want to, to go changes because I walk out to see a Lieutenant Colonel air force, Lieutenant Colonel on my radio, on my frequency in my area of operations controlling Kim Campbell. And I wonder what the hell is this guy doing? Mm -hmm. Why are you on my radio? Why do you think you can control airplanes? Why are you in my AO controlling? He, so my battalion commander, I was inside had said, Hey, um, we are taking a bunch of guys are coming over this bridge. It's a bridge that we can't see them coming up over. They're shooting RPGs at us. They're shooting AK 47s. We got these guys. I can't, I need you to go. I need the air force to take care of this. Just like they did last time. Kufa did this for me, man. Go, I, I can't find Kufa. You're here. Can you do this? And he says, sure, I can do this. No, he can't. He doesn't know the AO. He did not see where the AAA was shooting. He does not know the tactical situation that we've been dealing with on the ground. He, I don't even know if he can, if he, did he figure out, are there Marines over there? I don't know. So I walk out to see him on the radio controlling two airplanes. They're A-10s. I can physically see them basically right above me. And within seconds of me walking out, I hear a female voice on the radio. I'm hit. I'm hit. And I hear Bino because his voice is just as obvious as Donk's. He's my squadron commander. And I hear Bino say to that female voice, Break left, break left, flare, 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 very calm, cool, collected. 
giving her very directive commands to get her out of the AO because she just got hit by a surface to air missile. If I had been that guy on the radio, would I have been able to give the AO update and keep her safe? Would I have given her different tactics to keep her safe? Would I have said to her, maybe you need to be a little higher altitude? Would I have been the guy that was on the watch for those man pads that I was worried about the very day prior? But no, instead it was this stupid lieutenant colonel that was that maybe thought war was a game, that maybe thought that, you know, this is my chance to play and have fun and control some airplanes. You kidding me? Get off of my frequency, get out of my AO. And he hands me my radio back as they check out and he says, ah, good luck. And I think in shame, he walked away because I think he knew that what he just did was stupid. And now I was the one left holding the radio. I was left holding the bag. I'm standing there listening to the radio calls of my squadron mates as she is hopefully not getting shot again, as she is hopefully able to continue to pilot. And I can hear Bino's voice giving her directive commands. I can hear her responses. I know I'm the only one that knows and cares and is listening to this. And I've got a battalion commander that's saying to me, hey, can we bring in any more aircraft? I'm like, no, we're not bringing in more aircraft. Are you kidding me? I just got one shot up. And all these are, are dudes with RPGs and AK-47s. You can kill them yourself. You're just frustrated because you can't, you can't, you don't feel like you can shoot back. I'm not bringing in airplanes for that and getting somebody else shot up. No. And I'm listening to KC as she's going back south. And I get to sit there for the next hours and hours and hours because I didn't know it was KC. And I didn't know what happened. All I, do, all I knew was that she checked out and she headed south. And I got to sit there thinking what I could have done differently. And, and Monday morning quarterback, why did I go inside? You know, why did, I, why did I do this? Why did I let this happen? That's my radio. I'm responsible for this. And I, I questioned myself and I carried that guilt with me all the way back to the States for, for a long time until, and thank God, you know, it was a while after that that I finally got to link up with KC again. And, and I found out, you know, hours later that she'd done something amazing, that she'd limped her way back in yeah. an A-10 because A-10s can do that. Mm -hmm. She'd gone to manual reversion and she'd, she had no hydraulics. So she had to fly at the most difficult airplane to fly, which is an airplane that she's, you know, pulleys and cables to figure out how to fly. It, it does not have a great track record of being able to land like that. Generally, it's so you can get out of the AO and you can punch out, but she landed the thing. And it's freaking amazing that she did. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, what a story. Go listen to her story. It's amazing what she did. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, and the reason that I felt like I needed to tell that story and why I think it's so applicable to my story today is Donk asked me to, to think about and process how I feel about KC. And I put it down on a piece of paper and I wrote it out. I'll summarize it for you because I had to, I had to process, how do I feel about KC? And the word that comes to mind is thankful. I am thankful for KC because what could have been so bad, what could have been catastrophic, what could have been a horrible thing, she has turned into such goodness. She tells her story in an inspirational way. She inspires so many more people. She did it while she was on active duty. Anytime she was ever asked to tell her story, she did it over and over and over again to inspire people, not because she wanted to point at herself. She doesn't say, look at me, look at what this great thing that I did. She, she tells her story to say, you can do amazing things too. You can be resilient too. You can adapt and overcome in challenging situations. She has an amazing voice that this circumstance gave her and she is using it for such good. And I am so thankful for that. So I am thankful for Casey. And my goal that with my story is that I might do much the same. That, that I have a, of a similar but a very different story that's going to talk to similar but very different people and going to connect in a very different way to other people. But I want to use that story for good and to preach at people to say, you know, PTSD, it doesn't have to be, the D doesn't have to be there. It doesn't have to own you. We've all been through trauma. It doesn't even have to be combat trauma. There, I mean, you want to talk about issues we've got in the Air Force today? I mean, sexual assault issues, dealing with combat issues, dealing with issues at home, social issues in the world today. Everybody's been through trauma. We all need to be able to deal with it in different ways. 
We all need to get the opportunity to seek the help that we need. We all need leaders to support us as we do that. I know that part of my calling in the Air Force and maybe after the Air Force is to continue to tell this story. And so, Mark, I, I want to say thank you to you because I got to tell you, I've listened to a lot of your episodes. I've listened to the, you know, from one end of the spectrum to the other. And what you are doing through this podcast is very important. It, and, and it's different for every person because my story today is going to speak to somebody that somebody else's story wouldn't speak to. And your last guest and Donk and Billy Bob and KC and all the others that you've talked to that have different stories, they're important and they need to be spoken. And, and everything you are doing through this podcast, and I know you're doing a lot of other things as well, and the different programs we have for veterans um, are so important. The Wounded Warrior Program, the, um, uh, I, I mean, I can't, I can't list them all. I, because there's so many of project them. one and I, I, is a yeah, great one. Yes. Yeah. Pro, yes. I can't, I can't list them all there, but they're each and individually, they're all serving different people in different ways and different needs. And we need all of them yep. because there's so many people that are hurting out there today. Um, and, and I just hope that me being on your show can just contribute to that in a positive way. So Absolutely. all I can say to you, Mark is thank you. Well, look, your passion, um, your, your certainly your energy and your want to tell your story is incredible. And I, I think it, it, it rings true that the message you're trying to get across uh, is one that's consistent throughout a lot of our, our guests who come on the show. But it's like you said, it's, it's unique to everybody, right? Like everybody comes at it from a little different. No two PTS cases are exactly the same. Um, there's no cookie cutter way to get through this. Everybody just kind of has to work through it in their own way. Uh, and, and some people have similar parts with others and some people have different parts with others. But the point is finding somebody that you can relate to that, that your part relates to. Uh, that common ground, that commonality, I think, is what sort of binds us still in, in a, in a post-war uh, world that we live in now than one that we were going through before. And so, you know, I mean, look, you spent so much time telling your story. I, I'm not even going to try to you know, encapsulated. The crazy part is, is that's just one small snippet of a 20 plus year career, right? Um, yeah. So, I, I don't think uh, it, and I, I, and I you ahead. know, it's worth mentioning um, because I, I mean, it's, it's weird to say, but sometimes you also got to put your money where your mouth is because this was right. Like this, what actually happened to me was very early on in my career. Sure. Um, since then I've had an awesome opportunity to be, you know, DO squadron commander in the JTAC community. I look forward to awesome opportunity to be a, a group commander in the JTAC community. Um, but I've also had to put my money where my mouth is when it comes to this. Um, about a year and a half ago, um, I was diagnosed with something called superior canal dehiscent syndrome, um, which is a problem between your balance, eyesight, hearing, um, inner ear problems. Okay. Um, and last in July, 2020, I had to have brain surgery. Wow. Um, and then I had to relearn to walk. <sighs> um, and, and so a lot of people have been through COVID and talk about how that's affected them. I think my COVID experience was very different than most people's because I didn't spend it dealing with that. I'd spend it dealing with a very different medical issue. I, um, and so so to take some of these things that I preach to other people, I've had to preach it myself. Yeah. Um, and, and so as I, as I have gone through this last year and a half where um, I, I mean, the process, all the symptoms that come with this and they're debilitating. I, for a period of time when I was diagnosed with this, I would end every single day with blurry vision, a splitting headache, mm. and basically not barely able to walk. Um, I, um, I mean, it, it started off with, I remember the first time I noticed the the balance issue. I was coaching my son's soccer team, running across the soccer field, and I shouted across the field. And one of the problems that this syndrome gives you is it connects your voice to your own hearing and my own vestibular system. And so my own voice basically knocked me off balance. I almost fell over um, just from shouting across a field. Um, and 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 that that progressed to the point where, I mean, it was just massively affecting. At everything that I did where by the end of this, basically I could sit and work on a computer in a quiet corner and couldn't raise my voice above, uh, above a, a monotone. 
Um, and then being able to get surgery and the pain of, you know, trying to recover from that. And I've got an awesome scar you can see on the side of my head um, where they cut open my head. Wow. And basically, instead of pushing people away, of, of bringing people in and, and wanting to rely on that community around me and realizing that, man, it's a good thing I was in good shape because I, I'm not working out. I can't even, I mean, it, I, I barely, I mean, it's been a year and a half and I'm just getting back into PT after this thing. Wow. Um, and knowing that, you know, through this whole thing that, you know, I'm still well founded on that, that spiritual pillar and knowing my purpose and why I'm doing what I'm doing and, and, and who God is and, and, and who I am. And, and so I, I had to put these things into practice recently. Um, and, and that just gives me another part of the story. Like that's, I, I mean, it gives me the opportunity to say, Hey, if you're out there and you're dealing with this really weird thing called superior canal dehiscence syndrome, call me. Cause I'll tell you my story and I'll walk through it with you. Um, it's just another part of my story. It's just another trauma that I've been through and it's just something else I've had to bounce back from. It's just another opportunity for me to say, you know, put my money where my mouth is. I had to take a knee and now I'm back because just a couple months ago I got requalified to fly an airplane. It took a long time. I had to relearn how to walk. Then I had to learn how to walk, run again. I had to figure out which ways up. It took a lot, a lot, a lot of vestibular therapy, but I got there. By, by God's brother. grace, I got there. <laughs> Resiliency. I mean, honestly, it's uh, it's kind of been a calling card of what you went through earlier on in your career and what you're doing now in the latter part of your career. And I, I think it's amazing. It's an incredible message. And certainly as you get in front of all those airmen, when you take uh, control of your group, it, it, that, that'll come through and through all the way through the end. But it, I mean, listen, it's been amazing hearing you tell your story. Again, I, I, I love the emotion that you tell it with you, kind of bring us all there with you uh, and allow us to sort of feel it right alongside you. So from that standpoint, I think it's it, it's incredible that you uh, are able to communicate it so effectively. And however long it took you to get there, it's great that you can do it now because I think the message is, is super, super important. But we want to wish you nothing but the best of luck going forward. Obviously, stay healthy. Good luck taking charge of group. I mean, I know it's going to be a great, great time in your career uh, and many more years of success. But the best to you and your family and everything. Certainly, we, uh, we, we can't thank you enough for joining us today, man. It's been great talking to you. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate it. All right. John Coke Loker, thanks for being part of the Hazard Ground. You've been listening to Kill Cliff's Hazard Ground podcast, hosted by Mark Zeno. If you have an interesting story to tell and you'd like to be on the show, send us an email at producer at hazardground.com. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.